All right, here we are, another live stream, boys. Welcome, guys, to the High Stakes PLO podcast. I am Joey Grim One. We are back here live streaming from the YouTube channel. I wish I could have edited this uh, intro I just did because I, I didn't say what I wanted to say. But, uh, yeah, so uh, just so you guys know that all podcasts are up on iTunes. Uh, you can search Joe Ingram, Chicago Joey, anything like that. Um, my Poker Life episodes that I recently started, which is a new series that's not with PLO people, uh, those episodes are up. And we're doing another live stream this week, Thursday, 12.30 p.m. Pacific time with Shaniac, Shane Schlegler, Shane Schlegler, who is a uh, longtime tournament player, and he also enjoys raging as much as I do, probably more. So let's get into this episode. We have a very long time high stakes PLO no limit live nose bleeder TV star fucking you know one of the one of the men one of the one of the end bosses in uh in poker. We got Donnie Stern Ansky. What's up, man? What's up? How's it going? Happy to be here. All right, let's see if we can hear you. Can you talk again? Can you hear me? Um, no, it's a bit low. Should I say it might close? be closer. I, there's a microphone here I can put on. All right, let's see. Well, I, I feel like I'm really close right now. Yeah, it's definitely pretty low. What the fuck? Okay, hold on. Okay. So guys, we are, like I said, we are live streaming this on YouTube, so if you have any comments, questions, anything for either of us, you can go ahead and tweet them at either one of us or comment in the YouTube chat. And let's see. Donnie's trying to get his audio a bit louder here so we can all hear him. How's this? It's a bit lower. Um, let's see. Can anybody out there let me know how the volume sounds on their end? I'm not in my own house, and I'm not on my own computer, so I'm just kind of borrowing stuff here, but uh -huh. I can use this. Well, let's try that and see how, see how it goes. Um. We're live, guys. Technical difficulties sometimes, you know. He's in Vegas, he's, he's tank topping it up. He's playing live tournaments, you know. He's. Can you hear me now? Um. Maybe, you know what? Maybe it's uh. Hold on, hold on. Never mind. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Never mind. I take it back. It was because I had my volume low on my computer. I'm an idiot. All right, let's get into this. Wait, now we actually can't hear you. Let's try no mic. Okay, no, shit, what the fuck? <laughs> Sorry, guys, we should probably hire somebody. Seriously. All, All right, right, can I mean, you hear me now? Yes, we're here. All right, finally, we're good. Still? No, we're good. We can hear you now. You can hear me. We can hear you. All right. All right, cool. All right, let's let's get into this, man. What are you up to, man? So you're out uh, you're out in the World Series right now, right? I am. Uh, decided to come out for another summer of live tournaments, and uh, I'm actually playing some live cash this summer, which I don't usually do. Um, yeah, probably a mistake generally, but I don't know. It's just kind of my routine every summer to do this. Are you uh? Do you stay at a house with people out there? It looks like you're in a house right now. Yeah, I'm staying in uh, in uh, Lucky Chewy's house, Andrew Lichtenberger. He well, owns uh, are you staying there with a bunch of guys right now? Yeah, there's uh, Chewy lives in this house. Um, Aaron Jones, uh, Golfa, uh, Asani Fisher, who I believe is a, a fan of the podcast. A uh, um, couple other guys. Yeah, there's there's Quite a few poker players out here. Sounds like, um, do, you, do you still have fun when you go to poker houses in Vegas? Because I'm guessing you've probably been doing this for a bunch of years now. Do I? Yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't really have fun like in the way you would describe fun. Probably like I don't really party or anything like that. But I, I enjoy being here. Um, but it's mostly just I'm just here to grind, basically. So that's kind of what I noticed was was when I when I went out to Vegas one summer. I went out there kind of have fun, and you know I was expecting all these people that I was friends with to, to be the same way, like, hey, let's go out, let's have fun. But 
I, it seems like most poker players, while they're out there, they take that same approach where they're focused on playing poker, making money, having some good results. Yeah, I wasn't always like that. Uh, definitely when I was like 21, 22, um, my, you know, I was there to kind of party and have fun and maybe win some money playing poker if I was lucky or whatever, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't take it too seriously. Uh, and that was kind of me for a while. Uh, I know like a lot of people are kind of the opposite. They like used to grind super hard. Now they like kind of relax. They have some money or whatever, you know. But for me, it's been progressively going the other direction. Like I've just been much, much. I keep getting more and more serious about poker and caring less about, you know, uh, you know, being social and, in, you know, enjoying my time or whatever. Because uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm really I love playing poker. And I'm still like, really passionate about it. So I'm happy to just be out here grinding tournaments and. Plus one tournament and immediately go play like ten hours of cash. Like that's that's fun to me and that's that's like what I want to be doing. Yeah. So actually I need to do an introduction for you because I, I when I was asking my friends, some of the my PL friends I talked to, I was like, Hey, like you know a podcast tonight, like who are you having on? I said I was like, Oh, uh Donnie Stern, Anski. They're like, I don't know much about him. Now, obviously I've been around a long time, so I feel like I, I have a pretty good idea about you, but you're actually probably pretty unknown to uh, a decent amount of the poker world right now. Like, there's the thread in news, news gossip on 2 Plus 2 where people are asking about, you know, the guys, what happened to the guys that live in the 2 months, 2 million house. And no one really even knows that you still put in pretty heavy volume and play. You're playing 20 by 50. We've had a bunch of hands from you. You play a Supernova 9 on Poker Stars. We've had hands from you on most of the podcasts I've done so far. But <laughs> I lost where I was going with that. But, you know, so. How's your uh, online results been so far this year? Um, this year has been going really well. Uh, I've been very happy with uh, 2014 how it's gone so far. Um, I've been I pretty much played like more this year than I've ever than I've ever played in like the first half of any year by like a lot like probably twice as much. Um, and I'm playing like pretty high stakes for certainly for me. Um, and I mean I'm winning. Quite a bit in, in the PLO game, so I'm, I'm, you, know, I, you know, I'm happy for the results so far. Uh, obviously, with PLO, a ton of variance, and you know, anything can happen. But I'm pretty confident I'm winning the games I'm playing, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the state of, of like my team and what I'm, what I'm doing, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know where I was going. I was giving you an intro, and I, and I lost my train of thought at. When I started talking about PLO, I got all excited. You're playing online. I just got happy. So, you've been playing high stakes poker for just. I'm gonna. I'll go through it, and then you can fill in the blanks and correct me where I'm wrong. Cause this is the kind of idea I have in my head. So you've been playing high stakes poker about. I'm drinking, by the way. I hope that's okay. Hey, no, that's we encourage drinking, drinking, raging on the podcast for sure. So you've been playing about eight to ten years. You were playing in the highest stakes games for a pretty long time now. You were on a television show called Two Months, Two Million, which if anyone hasn't watched before, I encourage you to go check it out on PokerTube. It's uh, one of the better poker reality, and by the better I mean probably the best because there actually weren't too many others, poker uh, reality kind of TV shows where you spent, you and um, you guys were in a house in Vegas and you tried to make two months, or two million dollars in two months. Then Black Friday kind of came, and I think you took a bit of a break but then you recently come back. I think you might have lived in Toronto, and you also live in Mexico now, and you've been gradually working your way back up the, the PLO ranks on Poker Stars, and now you're playing 25, 50, 50, 100, and uh, the 10, 20 games on a pretty regular basis, right? Yeah, I mean, I was playing much lower stakes after Black Friday. Um, well, that's, that's one thing I want to ask you about, because I mentioned that here before. When I was living in Australia, and I remember you showed up, you were playing... Uh, you're playing like three, six, five, ten with me, and I believe some other people that I talked to were asking me, you know, why is you why are you playing so low? And I, I kind of speculate over time that, you know, you you took a break after Black Friday, you finally you decided to finally relocate, and you just wanted to kind of get your way back into the games. And I think that's a rare thing you actually find for poker players these days is where they can reacclimate themselves to lower stakes than they're used to. And kind of you know work their way back up in a way. Well, you know, I wish it was it was just that responsible, but really it was mostly just because I didn't have enough money to play higher stakes. 
<laughs> it's just not like it wasn't like I was being super responsible. Or anything. I I'm I'm thinking you're responsible. I'm gonna go. With, oh, I'm gonna go with that correction. It was, it was I was playing like you know one two and two five zoom no limit out of necessity. Um, and I mean Black Friday was like a huge hit. Obviously, you know I was playing higher stakes and I was making like a lot of passive money before Black Friday, and I immediately stopped making all that. Um, and I like really wasn't that good. I think uh, at PLO until maybe like a year and a half, two years ago, when I really started taking it much more seriously and being much more analytical, I guess, with my approach to it. Um, so you know, I spent a lot of time just like not winning at PLO and just breaking even and kind of winning small at no limit. But really feeling like I wanted to move to PLO because I thought the action was better, but I wasn't really winning at it. And then, I mean. Yeah, I obviously like I want to say it's because I got better, but it's also like you know variance is crazy in PLO. Who knows? Maybe you know. Who knows? Like what what your true win rate is in it at any given time. I mean, if you're winning at all, it's, it's good, obviously. That's definitely true. The the variance in PLO is often. I think people understand that it is a pretty high variance game, but at the same time, they also aren't really like you can go on these very large hears over a couple hundred thousand hand samples and you can also go on a similar downstretch where you're you know losing over a pretty good sample but you're also might be must be in some of those games so it's like the variance in the game is just, that's why I, I try to tell people when they ask me you know like I'm not winning a PLO like what can I do and obviously you want to tell them to improve but at the same time it's just about it just happens you know it's about why you're in that downswing but on the other yeah, you know, I think I suffered from an issue too much where I used to sometimes look at like my last hundred thousand hands and I was like, you know, break even after all an EV or something like that, or like slightly losing or slightly winning. And I would tell myself, you know, it's only hundred thousand hands of PLO, it doesn't mean anything. And it's not that it means something in that like, oh, this is your true win rate, you need to deal with this. But it you know, if you do spend a lot like uh, any amount of time not winning uh, at an amount that you'd be happy with, then it's just all the more reason to just be more, um, you know, critical of yourself and, and, and have more reason to, to study, like, your roots and see what you're doing wrong and just, you know, maybe not play quite as much and take a little bit more time to study and, and watch what other players are doing and, you know, just reviewing. Because um, I think too often I would be, like, in denial. I would just say, like, oh, you know, 200,000 hands, and I'm winning at like 0.06 big wise per 100. Just variance or whatever, you know? But like, it's not just variance always. Sometimes you're just not winning. And sometimes you, you know, I mean, having an ego is good. You want to win, but you don't want to be, uh, you know, be arrogant and just assume that you're winning when you might not be, you know? That's true. That's. I think that's a very good advice you can kind of give to, you know, players coming up right now is that, you know, kind of being honest with yourself and identifying. I mean, obviously it's hard to identify, am I good, am I bad, you know, like outside of just looking at the results, am I winning, am I losing. It, it's, I think that's a, one of the things that separates someone that's playing mid-stakes, someone that's playing small stakes is the ability to recognize that you actually do need to work on your game more a bit outside. And it sounds like, were you, so when you used to play high stakes, did you play the high stakes pretty much that ran? Did you feel like you were good at that time, and then when you came back, you just weren't that good anymore? I mean, I think you're overstating my, my time in, in nosebleeds. I mean, I played, like, for like a, yeah, like for like a year or two on and off, I would, like, jump into, like, rail heaven when it was running, 501k no limit, or, like, 200 400 no limit. Um, but, you know, it was, like, it was not very long Long lived. You were still a twenty five fifty regular. Well, you know what happened was was yeah, I was a twenty five fifty regular when like the nosebleed games on on full tilt just sort of exploded and you know it used to be like, you know, you'd be a twenty five fifty reg and sometimes fifty one would run or one two or something, and all of a sudden it's like two four and then they open up five hundred one K and next thing you know, like the only stakes in online poker are like twenty five fifty below and below or five hundred one thousand. You know, like, so if you were 25-50 red, you couldn't, like, there wasn't, like, 50-100 to play to move up to or whatever. You know, it was, like, 25-50 was, like, the top of, like, the normal economy. And then there was, like, the the crazy stakes, you know, like, and, and I feel like what happened was, 
Uh, it seemed like at first, obviously, like it changed over time as people kept playing and you know the better players prevailed and all that. But it seemed like at first, that, like all the twenty-five fifty regs pulled together and shared action and took shots at like at Rail Heaven in, in the games with like you know Gus, uh, Zygmunt, Benjamin, Guy, Tom, Phil, the Dangs. Like those were like the regulars, and then there was like a bunch of twenty-five, fifty regs taking shots. And it seemed like me and my friends, and like some of my other colleagues, whatever you want to call them, you know, guys who I wasn't friends with at the time, it seemed like everybody. This is, I guess, like two thousand eight, two thousand nine. We're talking about. It like everybody who took a shot at fifty or five hundred one k just lost. Like me and my group of friends probably lost a few million collectively. You know, uh, you know, I know like Ike got like smashed at first. Um, you know, a bunch of other regs that were just like probably beating the games. Just everybody got smashed, and the only people that were winning were like Tom, Phil, the Dangs. And so for a while, it's just like they just beat everyone down. So like all these like the the, the twenty five fifty regs weren't even playing anymore. So they just had like this tiny player pool to themselves, um, and it kind of like stretched out the economy in like this weird way where they were just like. It was, it was just like the, it was so big. It was so big that it became like untouchable once like a bunch of people like lost and couldn't and couldn't uh, play anymore. Um, that was kind of my experience playing nosebleed like back in the day. The, the back in the day time of full flow. Um, obviously now it's like a totally different situation. There's not like 200 400 running regularly like there used to be. Yeah, it feels like now these days 5100. Like barely seems to run as on poker stars. I don't really look at full tilt ever, so I don't know how action is on that site. But when I see when I open when I sometimes look for hand histories or I just check out who's playing still, it seems like 5,800 of stars rarely runs, and 2,550 has now become like the high stakes, and that's basically where all the action is for the most part. Yeah, it, it, it's certainly that way. I mean, honestly, full tilt it sucks because it used to be like a great, you know, it used to be like a great option, like with stars with full tilt. You have some other sites. I like don't. Even, I sometimes forget to open full tilt. Like if I'm like, you know, if the action's like kind of dead, and I'm just like opening every site that I have money on. I, you know, like I'm opening like five sites. You know, I'll open like eight, 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 and I poker, and I like forget about full tilt. Why do you think that is? Because <laughs> there's never any action. I mean, no, there there is some now, like twenty five, fifty. Like also, like I put in like this amount of work at like forty big blind PLO, and even like some thirty big blind PLO. But the full tilt six max games, it's twenty big blind and five, and I, I mean, I'm sure there's like a lot of edge to be had, and people are making big mistakes. But it's just like, I don't know, I don't have an enemy to buy for a thousand sometimes and twenty five fifty. It's just I wish you would, because also then what happens is like, you know, if you start getting deep with somebody, like even if the game is soft and you're like sitting five k deep, and there's like somebody five k to your left, and the rest of the stacks are like one k, like. You know, good luck. <laughs> it's really tough to win in that game, no matter how soft it is. Well, one of the hands that we're going to talk about today, I got about six hands picked out. One of them actually features someone who's frequently found with five to twenty-five big blinds. Deldar. Oh, th this is a hand that was discussed in the Me and Lafort podcast, and then the person who was the main, uh, main uh, villain in the hand was Jeans, and he actually chimed in as well. And I'm very interested to get your opinion on this when we start talking about some hands here. Do you know which hand I'm talking about? Yeah, the, the ten nine seven three double suited, and I king king eight three single suited, and and yep. dealt the ace queen queen six. I think Deldar was grinding it out with the with the six big blind stack or something like that. So yeah, Deldar is uh you know uh yes he, he's frequently seen with some silly amount, but uh, I do think he's like one of the best short stackers. Uh, on stars, and I actually have, like I have a lot of respect for his for his game. Maybe not his antics, but his game I have a lot of respect for. I definitely I, that's when I, that's when I played him a lot. I thought his short stack. I always thought he was like really good, and I was in a way I was like happy he didn't play deeper. But at the same time, I was tilted as fuck because he always had these really dumb stack sizes and you know with spots that you're isolating. You know a guy that you're 120 big blinds with, which is the reason you're playing the game, and he's in position on you with 16 big blinds. No, I mean, I've done my share of short stacking, so I certainly can't talk shit. It's one of those things that, like, I, it's, you know, it's like a, I, it's kind of like a necessary evil sometimes to be short stacking. Like, there's just some games where I just don't want to be full stacking based on the lineup and who, who has what stacks. 
and there's just a lot of edge to be had by short stacking sometimes, and I hate it. I wish it wasn't. I wish you. Ever, I, th I wish like everybody had to buy it for 100. Um, so you know, I can't really talk talk too much shit about it, um, even though I kind of hate. It. Um, I have a pretty good build our story though, actually, uh, and this is just like kind of like what I expect of him, which I can't really blame him for. It's like you know, I have to like tip my hat to it, but um, it's just kind of silly. Is uh, one time I was playing like. Uh, I had like four Zoom tables going, and I was sitting at heads-up tables, like 25, 15, 51 on stars. And I always, like, I usually do that, like, even if I'm grinding a six-pack session, I always sit at heads-up empties in case I get some, like, good heads-up action. Cause, you know, good heads-up action is usually even better than any six-pack action. Um, and, you know, it, it, in stars, it was, like, kind of the king of the hill situation. And it's, like, pretty clear, like, what, like, the rankings are, like, who gets to sit when, you know. And there's certain people that never sit with me. Like, Deldar never sits with me, and usually if I sit with him, he gets off the table, like, right away. Um, and I'm sitting, and uh, I think, like, Pimpy Limpy comes and sits at my 25-50 table. Like, one of those regs that, like, I usually play, but I won't play if I have, like, a ton of action. Um, but I'll definitely play if, like, there's no nothing crazy going on. But I have, like, good 6-max action, so I said, like, uh, hey, I got good 6-max action. You want the table or whatever. This is a 25-50. And he says, yes. And then, like, not, like, three seconds after I say that, Deldar sits at me 50 100 table. And he never sits with me. He always gives up the table when I sit. And he, and he posts. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> are you trying to play? And he goes, saying, I'm like, were you reading my chat on the other table? Because <laughs> he knows, like, I'm not actually trying to play. So he wanted a table. He's like, yes. So he was like, I don't know, he just like has the lobby up and he just like immediately opens up the table and sees the chat. Like it was like it was like one it, it took like three seconds. And he just did that to try to like steal my table because he thought I wouldn't play him at that like exact moment. So obviously I spoke to him. But and it was just I, it was just like really like the, like one of the nittiest things I've ever seen. And, <laughs> I, mean, it, not... I don't blame him either, because it's like, you know, he he can't play against the fish if he doesn't if he doesn't get a heads up table. So, and, and it was like all good players sitting heads up, so he wasn't going to bump anyone. But then he sees that I'm not like actually willing to play, and he just immediately sits. That was that was pretty sneaky by him. So couldn't some other, another reg sit him then? Um, if like if he if if he bumped me, yeah, somebody else could steal his table. But like he is willing to play some people, I think. I don't know. I mean, I'm not really sure. Uh, I don't. You know, I don't like follow too closely like which other regs are playing each other and stuff. You know. Yeah, I never did that as well too much, but I, I got to think in my memory bank, maybe the past eight years, I've never seen Deldar play anybody heads up. That would be considered a regular, so... I mean, he's played me a little bit. He, like, he occasionally like will battle for a table. Like, that, that time he did, but for the most part, he doesn't. I mean, I, I don't know why not, and I think he's like one of the better one, like, when he's, he's one of the better players. I think he should probably battle some people. He also sits with only 40 bigs and heads up, too, which is like kind of an advantage, just because a lot of the regs don't even want to deal with it, so they'll just give him the table. Yeah, I'd be extremely tilted as fuck if you sat me with 40 big lines. And yeah, of course. So do I. Yeah, it's an annoying thing. So how's your World Series been going so far? So you're in Vegas. You've been there since it started, correct? Yeah, I got here for the first event for the 25K. I played, played nine tournaments, I think. Cash um, one, 1,500, the millionaire maker. Um, but I've been playing some live cash, too. Um not winning at that either, but still, it's still young. The, the summer. What's the uh, what's your main game been so far? What have you been playing? Um, I have played some 100, 200 at Bellagio and at the Aria. I played 2550. Um, I played like yes, probably like, I mean, like 20 to 30 hours, maybe something like that. Are you playing the PLO games that are at Bellagio that run? Yeah, it's it's been all PLO. There's like no no limit running. I like the highest no limit I've seen running is like 10 Okay, I yeah I, the last time I was in Vegas, I played 51 and 1 2 at Bellagio too, and that was I didn't know there was any no limit that actually ran that much that high really anymore anywhere. It didn't seem like. I haven't seen big no limit at all. How are you? Uh, how do you like the games out at that Bellagio that you've been playing in so far? I don't know. I mean. I haven't played any like sick games. I mean, I think like the regulars that I'm playing with, Lazio are, are like much much worse than like the stars regs. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's live poker. You're getting 30 hands an hour or whatever, and um, 
you know, they're not, they're certainly not terrible, a lot of the regs. A lot of them are, like, pretty good. Um, and there's, like, a couple that, are, that have been very good. Um, and, like, I always kind of had this disdain for live, live cash. Like, I always kind of find it boring and a grind, and I don't really like playing it. I like playing live tournaments, because I don't know why, for some reason, it just, I find them, like, really fun. And live cash, I've always kind of disliked. Um, and part of the reason I dislike it is, like, the politics and waiting around and, and just all the bullshit that you have to go through. And and so I've always, like, kind of resisted. And then, like, everybody always tells me, like, dude, you got to play. Like, I was... Every, you know, every weekend this guy comes in, he loses half a million. And this guy comes in, he loses, like, 100K every night. You always hear about this, and I'm always like, oh, you know, got to get in on that or whatever. But, like, you never actually get to play in these games, you know? Like, I never, ever, ever have gotten into one of these games. I've been playing, like, the last, like, four days, uh, like, almost every night. I've been playing until 5 a.m., like, waiting for some drunk lunatic to come sit down, and it just never happens. And every time I come in to Bellagio, and I see if there's, like, a 100 turn like, game running, it's full, you know, like, it's, they're, the guy's already there, you know? Like, yet, last night I went to play Bellagio when Paul Pierce was playing. Obviously, I didn't get to play the game, you know? Like, it's like... I just, I miss Zoom, you know, I miss just, you want to play poker, you sit down and play fucking poker. I, I don't want to, like, have to, you know, grease some foreman or, or fucking have them text me every time, you know, some Saudi Arabian prince is going to come in and, and dust off half a million or whatever. Like, it's just, I, I just, I, I hate dealing with it. But on the other hand, you know, you know, you gotta, you have to, like, you have to put in an effort to, to get in those games, so, I mean, I'm willing to, yeah. It's just it's just frustrating. I'm just I'm just tilted by the whole experience. I can tell. I'm excited. I'm I'm excited hearing your tilt out of this. I can tell I'm you really just like it. I'm working on the scotch and, and by the end of this podcast I'll I'll be good. Okay, cool. I'm excited. I mean I don't actually I, I I haven't played live poker barely at all in the past couple of years. When I go to Vegas this summer I probably won't play any live poker at all either. So just because that kind of stuff definitely is annoying and like you said, I, I I don't know. I just hate, I hate playing. I hate playing live poker for the most part. So I mean, I, I'm overstating it. Like, you know, for the most part, like if there's a seat open, you go, you show up, you play. Like that's it. You know, and and if somebody sits down, they're not gonna like pull you off the table if you're not a red or whatever. That's not like it's not like it's it's that. And like all the four guys have been like very respectful and nice, and and it's been like a good experience so far. I'm just it's just like annoying that like you know. A lot of the best games are like set games. Like it's like, you know, they just like everybody just like shows up at the same time. They take the table and that's it, you know. And then like they just and then like all the regs just play until the amateurs leave. Period. Like they just don't get up, you know. So it's really tough to get to get into like the best games unless you're like really putting in the work. And I also don't really have it in me. Like I don't have like any hustle in me, so I don't have it in me to like befriend the amateurs and, like, make them think that we're boys so that he calls me for his game or whatever, like, I... I mean, I know I should, but I just don't. I just don't have it in me, you know? You know, we both have a mutual friend who I feel like is, is a bit decent at doing this. Brian, exactly. ha Brian Hastings, he sometimes gets in... Yeah, he plays in some good games in Florida, right? Yeah, you know, he's a... He, he kind of, you know, he doesn't seem like... He's not a hustler at all. No one would ever say, like, Stinger's a hustler, but... Hustler's probably better than no, but like, you kind of need to be a hustler in a way, you know. It's kind of how you have to be to get in to get in some of these situations. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I don't want to like talk shit about anyone, but you know, like a lot of like pros, they're like you know friends with the amateur, and I question you know how much they're friends with them, or they just like you know suck up to them. They make them think that they're friends, so they get in their games, you know, and they go play golf together or whatever, and then they go play poker together, and it's like, would they be friends if there wasn't the, the poker thing? I mean, I'm not, I'm, and I'm not even saying it's, like, wrong to do that necessarily, you know, everybody, you know, I'm not one to criticize if someone makes a living, um, as long as it's not, like, you know, unethical or or anything like that, but, it, I mean, it's deceptive, it's, I don't know, it's just the way I was raised, I don't mean raised, like, how my mother raised me, I mean, like, the way I, like, grew up in poker, like being an online player, and like my goal has always been not, you know, I'm not, I, my goal was never, I want to figure out the ways to get in the best games, it's always been, I want to figure out how to play poker the best, right, and yeah. 
I, if somebody like told me that that was dumb and that that's like a foolish way to do it, you should be thinking about how to just get in the best games and then you'll end up making more money. Like I wouldn't really disagree with that necessarily, but it's just for me, for what like what what keeps me excited in poker and what I like to do is is, is that approach, and that's just that's just how I've like always gotten by in poker. But I think the approach that you have probably was more prevalent in in past years. But obviously, you know, with games getting harder, with players getting better, with fish going away, you know, I think some people that might you know, do some things that we might consider like unethical or we might not try. I think they don't necessarily want to do them. It's just, you know, if you're used to making 100K, 200K, 300K from playing poker, now all of a sudden you can't, you have no other option to make money. Well, this is, if I do start doing this, then all of a sudden that, that, that income comes back, you know, so then it kind of feels like some people just end up doing that just because they feel like they have no other choice. So. Yeah, like I said, you know, I'm not going to criticize anyone for the way they make a living. Um, you know, everybody, you, know, you got to put food on the table. Uh, and, you, uh, you know, like, everybody, poker players love to complain about everything, obviously. Um, in reality, you know, you just have to adapt to every situation. And, 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 you know, like, some people, they can't beat online poker anymore, or they don't want to play online poker anymore, so they play in private games, and they do whatever, you know, they, they, they do what they have to do, and then... You know, all the power spent. That's, that's just the way it is. I would uh, let's uh, let's talk about let's talk about something happy. I have a list of topics here. I wrote down. I wrote them down in three minutes, and I somehow came up with twenty five topics. Now we're not going to talk about all these topics. It was just thing. It was like rapid fire things that came on my mind right now. So you after Black Friday, you what was your process like? So did you stick around the USA for a while? Or did you go back to school? I, you know, like what what did you do? What did you spend your time doing until you relocated? Right. So Black Friday was in April, uh, and then spent this a month doing nothing, wallowing around in misery. Um, and and uh, I went uh, I went to Vegas for the summer. Um, just I was you know I was probably gonna go to, I was basically gonna go to Vegas to play the World Series anyway. Um, and then all of a sudden, Black Friday happened, so I was like, "All right, I really got to go to Vegas. Uh, I can't, I can't make any money if I don't go. There's nothing I can do." Um, so I went to the World Series that year, uh, 2011, uh, and I went 0 for 19 at the World Series. Uh, so it was like a really bad start to the to the you know life after Black Friday, um, and I decided to move to Toronto after the World Series. Um, my girlfriend uh, was living there, um, and we were we were in like a long distance relationship basically before Black Friday, and so that was kind of always like floating around, like the idea of moving, um, and so it was like a pretty obvious choice to go to Black to go to Toronto. I was in New York before Black Friday, um, so we went to Toronto, and um, partially as like a way to get a permanent residence there, or not, a semi-permanent residence, um, I went to culinary school in Toronto. Um, Are you a good cook? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm in. I, what's that? I said I'm in. Lafort has me eating uh, 1,000 meals a day and, and 25 million calories, so I, I, I... He probably has you eating a lot of, like, chicken breast and, like, and, like carrots and, and stuff, yeah. Of course um, he does. I, I like I get a little bit fancier than that, uh, um, but yeah. So I went to culinary school. Basically, I was I was getting really like passionate about cooking for like a you know the year or two before that, and we kind of like I brought it up uh, going to culinary school in Toronto. I found a pro a one year like full culinary program was one year. It was, it was like five hours a day. For five days a week. Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Is that on my end? Yeah, I think it's on your end. It might be either because of uh, if you're wireless, there might be a bit of, de of a delay. Or um, the speakers might be. I'm not quite, quite sure what why the delay would be. It's been fine for the most part. Okay, okay. Uh, so basically, I. Uh, it's really hard to. Talk when you hear yourself talk. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is after my day. I went to culinary school in Toronto, um, and I really enjoyed the, the the process, and I enjoyed the school, and I, I learned a lot, and it made me a much better cook. And it was it was a good experience, but it also was just like another distraction away from poker, which I like didn't need, you know. And I really didn't improve much as a poker player in that first year because I was spending so much time in school. You know, I was waking up at like 7 a.m., going to school, doing like five hours, coming home at like noon or something, and I would like come home, be just completely exhausted, but I'd try to put in like, you know, a few hours playing poker. I would try to get like, like three, four hours in, and I didn't always have the energy. I probably wasn't playing very well, and, you know, I'd be passing out like at like midnight or something, which for me is extremely early. Um, and just, it, like I said, it was a really good experience. I'm very happy I did it, but it was also just a distraction from what I'm really doing in life, playing poker. Um, but in terms of like a long-term thing, I always kind of thought maybe, I mean, I'm not going to like quit poker to become like a line cook at a restaurant, you know? Um, but having this like in my, having this in my, Whatever resume or like, I don't know whatever you want to call it in my in my skill set having this experience I think might end up working out later in life you know I, like I don't, I don't like have like a specific goal of like owning a restaurant or something like that but I don't know, something in, in the food industry like it really interests me mm -hmm. um, but for right now I'm just a poker player and I'm an, an amateur cook who cooks a lot but but I I don't I don't intend on doing anything professionally with cooking for at least for the time being, not certainly in the next five years. So you, your girlfriend was in Toronto and you were in New York. How did you guys know each other? Um, well, we met through another poker player, actually, Peter Jetton. Oh, okay. Um, it's, my girlfriend is his girlfriend's sister. Who? I met, met through him. So I'm guessing you met them in Vegas? Mm, in Bahamas, actually, at PCA. So you meet in Bahamas. You guys are you guys are on the on the, the lazy river. You guys are in the ocean swimming with the dolphins. You're falling in love. You're having a good time. She goes back to Toronto. You're distraught. You go back to New York City. Black Friday happens, and then you decide this is a perfect opportunity to go to Toronto. Yeah. How long were you guys long distance for? Um, a, a year and change. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, I've never I, I couldn't go long distance for more than more than like one one it was a mess. I mean you know we like broke up a couple times and it was like it was you know it was it sucked it was awful but you know we endured for a while now I mean we're still together so, so you you're in Toronto and but you then you moved to Playa del Carmen yeah we moved down to Playa del Carmen in this past October so I've been there since um we were in Toronto for two years, then we've been in Playa del Carmen since October, um, and I mean, I'm in Vegas now, obviously, but we just signed a, another uh, a year-long lease in Playa for, from, until May 2015, so we're going to be there for another year. So she moved there with you, correct? Yeah. So what is she doing down there when, so you're spending a lot of time playing poker. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is she? You guys have like a network of friends you can hang out with. She has her friends. You have your friends. You know, how does that kind of dynamic work between the two of you guys? I mean, all of our friends are kind of the same group of friends. Like we have some other poker players and pop, you know other poker couples down there. Um, she you know keeps busy though. She volunteers at a dog shelter down there, and she's done some. She's taught done some English teaching. Um, you know, there's so sure she's happy there. She's not complaining. She doesn't want to move back to Toronto. Well, right. that's. Nice, much nicer weather. Yeah. Well, that's the thing I wonder about. Me and my girlfriend talked about, you know, moving outside the country again, and you know, that she'd be in a situation where we probably wouldn't have a network established at first, and you know, what exactly would she do? So I always, you know, find it kind of curious to see what other poker players that do relocate with their wife or girlfriend what they end up doing, because a lot of times they they're probably not going to get a job, so like it usually ends up being volunteer teaching English. Or professional fashion blogger, or some something like that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, I would recommend checking out Pile. It's 
pretty. It's a. It's a. In terms of like relocation spots for Americans looking to be able to play online poker, it's it's pretty solid. I mean, it's, it's got. Uh, you know, one of the main advantages is just getting in and out of Mexico is like no problem at all. You don't have to worry about a visa or anything like that, or getting kicked out of the country, or or getting rejected at the border. That's just not going to happen. Um, you can stay for up to six months at a time and then just leave and come back. Um, I mean, the rent is like really cheap compared to any like major first world city. It's safe as hell. Um, you know, and, oh, Mexico. You know, but no, it's, it's not like that at all. It's really safe. Um, and it's like right on the beach. I mean, we're renting a. Uh, we got a, a two bedroom condo like one block from the beach. You know, for like. Uh, you know, like a quarter of what I was paying in New York for, you know, a, a much smaller place. It's just, it's it's like a really solid place. I, I find it very easy to be a poker player there. I find, I have like no distractions. I can just do whatever I want. Our, my life, our lifestyle is like very easy going. Um, you know, I'm originally from New York and I'm used to like super fast paced, like crazy atmospheres and and people who are just always in a rush and like have a, a shitty mood and like fly it like could not be like it's the complete and total opposite. Right? Like nobody cares about anything. Nobody's in a rush. It's just very easygoing, like relaxed lifestyle. Hmm. I've never that wasn't one of my options. I, even though I've had some friends that have lived there, I've never. I always thought it was obviously you hear Mexico, you think like I'm gonna get kidnapped and sold in the drug trade. I'm gonna become a slave, or my girlfriend's gonna. Become a Mexican slave to you know it's just like that's the common common things that some people might think of when they think of living in Mexico. So that's always been in the back of my mind. It's not like a big worry, but it's definitely on my mind when I consider going there. I I wasn't ever really nervous just because you know it's I don't know it's, there's just tons of Americans there. It's like a huge expat community. Like you hear like walking down the street, you just hear like French and 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 Italian and and you hear Hebrew, you hear Dutch, you just hear people like, you know, every language is being spoken. You, there's just tons of Europeans, South Americans. Like, none of the Mexicans who live there are from there. Like, Playa, it's kind of like Vegas, honestly. Like, Playa del Carmen was a, a fishing village of, like, a thousand people 30 years ago. <laughs> it was like, it was it like didn't exist, you know? And it's just, like, exploded in the last, like, 20 years with resorts and, and like, new condos being built and stuff. And that whole area of Mexico is like is really awesome. It's just uh, it's, there's a lot of like untouched nature, and it's and it's obviously being touched quite a bit right now. But it's and there's there's tons of like outdoor activities to do. Um, like aside from having like a pretty drastic turnaround with poker since I moved there, and just doing really well and feeling like really inspired. The second best part about moving there, moving to Playa, has been uh, probably my girlfriend and I learning to scuba dive. Because it's huge down there. That's like one of the big things to do. And I've just become obsessed with scuba diving now. It's just so much fun. It's like one of the it's like the best outdoor activity I've ever done, you know. I like it more than skiing or I don't know, whatever. It's just it's it's just so unbelievably fun and it's like some of the best scuba diving in the world down there. You're you're talking me into and uh, into going down there at least visiting it out and checking it out because it kind of sounds visit. like you can go you can rent an Airbnb for like a month or something if you want to just like check it out you know and, and just and you know there is a huge community of poker players I don't uh, know if that's are the there any you PLO guys down there what's that are there any PLO guys down there um uh, you know uh, Cottonseed and Thanks, uh Lewis friend on on stars. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I know who he is. He's like an 08 player. He's like the best 08 player in the world or whatever, like one of the top guys. Uh, him and, and KPR, they both live down there. Um, but they're not really PLO guys. I mean, uh, Codency plays a lot of PLO. Is uh, that where Juan Bob lives? Uh, if he does, I've never met him. Um, he might live there. I have no idea. I, his location is Mexico, right? I can't wait to meet him. <laughs> I can't wait to meet him. Is he your anime or something? I... Oh, I'm playing a lot. I can't wait to meet Bong Bob. I just can't wait to meet him. There's some guys you can't. I, the cleaner, I can't wait to meet. You know, I just there, there's certain guys I'm very excited to meet. The Yusuf Ahmed, very excited to meet him. I, like, I, I kind of have like some of the same feelings with some of the regs because I don't really know that many PLO players. Like I know like so many of like the old school No Limit guys who I used to play with. I've like met almost all of them. 
certainly like any tourney players, I've met like almost all of them because you know I play live tournaments and they play live tournaments. Mm-hmm. But like the PLO regs, like I feel like a ton of them I haven't met, and I would like to meet them. And I, I have this like, weird feeling sometimes where like I just want to like uh, I don't know, like I just want to like shake them, not in like a violent way, but like, <laughs> you, like I play with you every day, you know, like it's just like I, you know, somebody like let me think, like. I don't know, like Barry Sweet or something. I played like oh, I, I love to him him six months with him, you know. I, I I play with him like on a daily basis. I don't know his name. I don't know anything about him. He could be like some fat old man, or or, or you know, I, I have no idea. But like sometimes I feel like I feel like this like closeness to some of the regs that I it's like you see them every day, but you don't actually see them. You know, there's like this weird curiosity there. I, I definitely definitely know what you mean. Cause it's kind of like you know all these people you interact with on a daily basis when you're out, you know, you don't actually ever really have any interaction with them, but these guys that you play with every day for years, or you play at least thousands of the pen with, you have these, like, interactions kind of constantly over the day, and you feel like, it's kind of like you guys are in a little fraternity in a way, and, you know, these are, like, your people that you're always around, and, you know, it is kind of exciting to, when you do finally get to meet those people in person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm excited to get, I haven't been to Vegas in I went to Vegas last summer, but I didn't meet anybody. I didn't do any poker th- stuff. I just went raging. So I'm excited to actually hang out with some people this summer and meet some new people and kind of meet a lot of other high six PLO players. That's going to be. Have you have you got a chance to hang out with any uh, uh, PLO guys while you're out there? Mm, no, not really. No. I haven't done any hanging out really. I just I just play poker. That's all. Right, and then getting that supernova lead of the live poker arena. Well, I'm trying to get supernova lead of the. Actual, oh, like the stars leave. What's your BPP count right now? Like 380. Easy, yeah, very easy. I think I, 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 I think I'll handle that like pretty, pretty easily. Like in May, I made uh, May was like a hundred thousand or something. You know, like I was like way behind pace before May, and then I put in in like 21 days or something. I got like a hundred thousand. So. Well, you sound like most people who are hopeful about Supernova Elite because they got 100,000 BPPs in one month, but then when you start losing money, that's when the make, keep playing that 100K each month, that's when it becomes a lot more challenging. No, you're right. And if, if, the thing is, like, it's not that bad at, like, if you're playing, like, 10, 20 plus. You know, you don't need to play that many hands. You know, like, 2,000 hands a day, like, I'll get no problem from, like, from when I get back to Mexico, like middle of July. Yeah. What's the uh, what's twenty five fifty BPP per hand? Is it like one point six ish or something? I don't know offhand. It's a lot though. Yeah. Let's uh we'll take some YouTube questions here. Obviously, um not obviously, but if you want to comment any questions, you can at me on Twitter or uh, comment on YouTube. So Johan uh, asks, is it mandatory to wear a tank top in the podcast? Seems to be standard. Yes. I'm I'm actually. I'm not sure I'm going to allow anyone else to be on a podcast without wearing a tank top. Stinger, he didn't wear a fucking tank top. I tried getting him in one. He's like, I'm not wearing a tank top. So that that was the, you know, we let him slide I on that. Was but. Uniform. I thought it was required. I thought, you know, I thought it would be like showing up to uh, to some sort of like banquet not wearing a tux. <laughs> I'm totally with you. I think everyone that's on the... Very inappropriate not to wear it. Uh, yeah, it really is. You know, have you seen this tank top? Wait, anybody, some people might have seen it. It says, eat, sleep, PLO. This is like the best tank top ever. That's pretty good. You know, what else is there in life besides eating, sleeping, and playing too low? Let's, uh, does, oh yeah, okay, have you ever played with Dan Bilzeri and Mike Jones asks, and seriously serious, says, does Blitz ever play at the Bellagio? Um, I've, right, I've, the, the short answer is no, I've never played with Blitz, and no, he doesn't play at Bellagio, I've never seen him there. I mean, not that I would know, I'm not like a Bellagio reg, who's Plenty of other people who know the answer to that, but I've never seen him there, and I, I, you know, in my limited experience, basically I've never played with Blitz, except um, this one time. I have to tell the story, uh, and I'm pretty sure my mom is watching this, but whatever. Sorry, mom. Um, so, um, it's okay. It's not that bad, you know. Okay. Um, there's a slight chance this was his brother. But I'm pretty sure it was Blitz. Um, like four or five years ago, uh, six years ago, it was six, six and a half years ago. Yeah, I was at uh, LAPC in 2008, Commerce, and I was playing 50, 100, no limit. 
and it was like late on Saturday night, and, the, and uh, there was like people drinking, carrying on everywhere, and and Blitz sits down in the 1500 game. I guess back then he splashed around at, at peasant stakes like that, you know, before he made 50 million playing poker. And he's sort of like he's he's like going off and he's like screaming at everyone at the table, like making fun of everyone, you know, being like playful but like carrying on with everyone. And he clearly like knew all, you know, it's all these like commerce rights that he knows, and I don't know anyone at the table, and he doesn't know me. He kind of just he passes me over like multiple times, doesn't say anything to me, and finally like there's like a lull, like it's quiet, and he just like looks at me, and he's just like peering at me and staring at me, kind of like. Okay. Oh. You, you like to fuck fat chicks. <laughs> Everybody at the table just like erupts in laughter, and he's just like, ah, ha, ha, "All right, I'm gone," and he just leaves. <laughs> what? Yeah, that was my one experience with Blitz in my life. So your experience with Blitz was you're playing live poker, and he said that you like to fuck fat chicks, and then, and then that was it. I don't think your mom's gonna not like that story too much. No, that's. I mean, for a Blitz story, that's about as clean as it gets. I think so. I love. I hope one day that I get to have Blitz on a podcast, and I hope one day I get to Dan to do some live raging with Blitz. I think that might be an experience. Do a little video blog, you know? That'd be great. I think that'll be fun. I think there's a slim chance that might happen at some point in time. He'll be in, in uh, stiff competition with Lafort for uh, for best looking in a tank top. Oh, Bilzerian? Yeah. No, Lafort, Lafort's, Lafort's my guy. I'm back in Lafort over anybody. Zarian's a Navy SEAL. Or he was. <laughs> yeah, I think that's been discussed on every possible outlet millions of times at this point in time. The $50 million playing poker, Navy SEAL, the best player in the world. I, I don't yeah. know. You know, people ask me, is he good? I tell them he's the best. That's what, because I get all kind of random people that ask me about him now, because everyone's seen him through all the Instagram stuff and the BuzzFeed stuff and the nude photos and the guns, the drugs. So it's like you get a lot of, like, noobs that come up to you and ask you if you know him. And I tell yeah, him. He's really, like, he's crossed over. He's not, like, a poker celebrity. He's just, like, he's just his own phenomenon, you know? What do you have, like, 200,000 followers on Instagram or something? He's got, like, 2 million followers on Instagram now. Yeah, his cat, his cat has, like, 100,000. I think so. And that girl that he's always with, I thought she was older, but I, I'm pretty sure she's, like, 19. He's, like, the number one girl that always shows up in all But I think he's got 2 million followers on Instagram. I don't follow too closely on any of his, like, shenanigans, but whenever something, like, especially crazy happens, I obviously hear about it. And, you know, like when he yeah. throws a girl off a roof, that sort of thing. When he throws a naked girl. <laughs> he's got 2.6 million followers. Pretty sick. That's a lot. I, I'm happy, but I think he's inspired a lot of bros out there to potentially try out some poker, to try out some live one two, or maybe deposit on lock and and uh, never get cashed out on lock or something like that, you know. So <laughs> I just picture these American guys like, oh my god, this guy plays poker, and then they're like googling poker and they're like lock poker. All right, what do I got to do? Western Union, one thousand dollars, done, and then they they never get they never see it again. That's that's a sad story. I don't want to think about that. Yeah, I know. I don't want to think about Locke either. Did uh, did he did he dress like a GI Joe back then? Mike Jones would like to know. I like this is I'm the wrong person to be asking about Dan Bilzer. I don't know anything about him. I can't I can't uh, I can't comment on whether or not he dressed like GI Joe. Okay. Um, I'm not here of expertise. Maze Maze David asks, "What's your screen name on 888?" Uh, that is a secret. Okay. It's an untracked. It's an untracked screen name, like every other every screen name is. Okay. He also asks, in what aspects have you improved the most in PLO in the last one year? Ooh, that's heavy strategy. Everyone knows I. Everyone knows how much I love talking strategy on the podcast. But um, you can feel free to answer that in, in any way you like. I mean, it's mostly like technical stuff, like. Um, Well, I, I don't want to give I don't want to like say certain because like that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, to to answer that question for me, it would be a very it would be very specific areas I feel like I've gotten better at. And when you say how or if you were to say the areas you gotten better at, you know, you can think about those and and figure out ways to maybe incorporate into your own game. So it's like, 
You know, it's a, well, it's like a, in general, I guess, an, an idea. Does anything come from specific, but I just think it's, like, generally been, like, I haven't, uh, um, like, I probably, I mean, I, I'm playing way more than I used to, but I'm also, like, I'm spending probably, like, five times as much time doing, like, off-the-table work is really what the difference has been. Like, that includes, like, watching videos, like, Phil Galfon and, and Odd Odson videos and, like, whoever else, like, anyone who makes videos, really, like, um, you know, even people who I think aren't that great, I still watch their videos because I play with them all the time and I want to see what they're doing. Um, you know, Any so... specific person that you might, that comes to mind when you say something like that? <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> that, it, that's just not, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. I don't I'll, want to I'll, 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 I'll name three names you can my camera's blurry, but I'll name three names and you just nod well, I'm not going to necessarily answer this question. That's but fine. I'm just going to name some names, okay? Okay. Durian. D-U-R-I-A-N. Are, are you waiting for me to, like, react or something? You have to talk for the, the camera to go on you, so just, like, humble, like, mum, mum or some, mumble or something like that. Okay. What, is, then, what is something I can say that's just purely neutral? So that I'm not offering any opinion, positive or negative. That's an opinion right there. Okay. What about Jay Nandez, eighty-seven? Neutral. I, I offer no. I offer nothing. Isildrun. I offer nothing. I don't want to get into. I don't want to get into to, to, to this specific stuff. He's your guest of the podcast, Isildrun. So okay, how do you feel about those training sites in general? Obviously, you used to be involved with Deuces Crack back in the day. Put out mm -hmm. some pretty good videos, I thought. I remember when I was coming up in the Nolan video. Actually, you know, this is fun. It's an interesting story. The first time I was ever personally a hand I played was in a training video. It was in one of your 1020 videos. It was the first time I ever played 1020. I, I made the worst play ever. The very first hand in the video, and I got stacked by you by 1020. Obviously, if aces, you run good. But that was my, that was, you know, I, I appreciate you, you introducing me to the 1020 No Limit on Stars game with my friend. That was, that was very nice of you. Yeah, um, I don't. Yeah, I don't make videos anymore. I'm probably not going to unless I get offered a really high amount. I just don't really think it's worth it. Um, I don't really care too much about like the the concept of it of like souring the games or whatever. That's kind of like a personal decision if you want to like ruin your own situation um, or if you think you are ruining it. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't. I don't blame anyone for making videos. Nothing like that. I just think on a personal level, I don't think it's worth it for what. You'd have to give up. Um, like for someone like Sauce, for him to do no limit videos is not that big a deal, I don't think, because first of all, most of his action is PLO, and secondly, most of his opponents, I don't think, like it's just like basically like Sauce is making videos that are like here, right, and like most of his opponents are like here or here or whatever. They're like you know right there. Like he's not playing with people. Who are like woefully behind him in no way. Like the Nolan who is so fucking tough that you know he might be bring, he might be making some like 10, 20 regulars like that much better, and they might in the future like compete with him or whatever, which is maybe going to affect him somewhat. Um, but I think what's going on in PLO right now is like there's like massive gaps between like the best regulars and the worst regulars. So I think like in PLO making videos is like much more costly. Um, in terms of like making worse regular better, or specifically making like the okay regulars, like just learn about your game and play against you specifically better. You know, and I'm not. I'm kind of just done with videos. I think for or at least for the foreseeable future. I'm not saying never, but you know. No, I mean I definitely think that I can't understand why more people be, are beginning to make. I mean I think like you know when Run It Once started there was. Phil making videos, Isle Drun, and Odson made a couple, and you know Team Barcode made like some of the biggest joke videos ever. That like, they don't even know. They, they just I don't even they just took a paycheck. Like, what? You never saw the dying videos. Um, I haven't played with them too much. You know, like when they sort of stopped playing online recently is when I sort of started playing at their stakes. So I'm I played very little with the dying. Well, they don't run bad. They run good. <laughs> They're like the biggest winners on some of the biggest winners on both sites. Yeah, that seems seems accurate. <laughs> Standard, but so okay. When Run One's first started, there's three people making videos. I asked Leo Isildrum, "What the fuck are you thinking, right? Like, why why would you want to do this?" This had to be like 2012, 
And at the time, I was like, you know, this is going to have a very, in my opinion, negative effect on the games. You know, it depends on your viewpoint, obviously, on, on the games. And kind of what's happened over time is that's exactly what's happened. Like you said, you know, you might not be be making the, the 10 cent, 25 cent guys better, but you're making those guys that might have been losing a PTBB at, at 2-4, 1 2, you're now turning those guys into break even or potentially a slight winner in those games. While these guys are playing in the same games you're playing in and they're playing against the same fish you're playing against, now they're taking a direct cut out of your money. No matter how much you got paid, you know, they're directly impacting your. Absolutely. You know, your game. Well, yeah, I mean, like, someone like Phil, like, for Phil, it's like different because, you know, he owns the site and he obviously makes a lot of money off of that. Or, you know, I think Phil also probably, I, I doubt he only does it for money. I think he partially does it for, like, the legacy or whatever you want to call it. You know what I mean? Like, sure. I think he, I think he mentioned something like that before, actually. Like, he, he's putting his, like, you know, he's putting his name on something and, and it's, he's creating something. And it's, it's, you know, I, I can understand that. He's, he's part of something big that, that, that is his. So it's kind of understandable. But on the other hand, you know, like, I watch every single Phil Galpin 2550. Or I watch every single Phil Galpin PLO. Uh, I don't always like watch them mid right when they come out, but eventually I'm going to watch every video. You know, I, I probably watch like 95% of them. And I play with him all the time. Um, and don't get me wrong, I think he's like really tough. Like, I think he's like one of the best regulars. Um, but I'm just saying, like, I, I watch every one of his videos. I see like all these things that he likes to do and this and that. So it obviously affects the way I play against him. Um, and, I mean, like, it doesn't make him necessarily less tough to play against, but, you know, removing some of, like, the, 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 like, sometimes when you play against somebody and they start doing some weird things and you're not, like, huh, I don't know, like, what he's doing this with, I'm not sure what kind of strategy this is a part of or what this means or whatever, like, removing all that, like, wonder and just knowing exactly, like, what part of his game it might fit into changes quite a bit, I mean, He's open, and he's opening himself up a lot. And he's probably good enough that it's okay, you know, that he can get by anyway. But you know, I can't help but think that his win rate would be higher if he wasn't making videos. I, I mean, I'd have to agree, wow. obviously, because... He's that, printed. That run at once, so perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think with Phil, like, he, he probably feels like he's on a very high level, which I would definitely think he is, too. So... He might not think he's actually giving us your, 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 what is that, scotch? And I'm also advertising for my favorite scotch here. What's the name of it? You want to give it a plug? Lefroy. Le, 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 Lefroy. Lefert? I, I could be pronouncing it wrong. If you have any Scottish, if you have any Scottish uh, listeners, they might uh, criticize my pronunciation of it. We definitely have some... Uh, we always have some interesting people to watch on a live stream or watch later. All kind of nationalities come in. I was saying something about Phil. I don't even want to, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Let's still go back to the YouTube comments. These are some of my favorites. Just reading comments all the time. Seriously Serious says, Deuce is cracked with my introduction to Anski. I loved his videos. I never did see Two Months, Two Million. First of all, you work in poker, bro. That's weird. Second of all, go watch Two Months, Two Million. I don't, why wouldn't you watch Two Months, Two Million? You know, looking back on that, I think we're probably three or four years removed from that. What you... What are your thoughts now? How did it change your life? Were you walking around New York City? Everyone's coming up to you. Donnie, man, we loved you in two months, two million. Like, you know, what was... You know, reflect on that a bit. Um, I had a great time with the experience. I thought it was, like, a super cool life experience to have. That You know, it was, like, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that, you know, obviously I'll never come again, that type of experience. It was, like... Like right at the right time in poker, where like poker was still big enough on TV and stuff. Yeah, that keep talking. I, I can't use the infamous pee bottles on the on the live stream, but keep talking, and I'm gonna go around the bathroom real quick. Oh, okay. So I'm just talking to nobody now. Well, I can still hear you. My bathroom's right connected to the window. Connected here. All right. So I guess with Google Hangouts, the, the camera's on me. I feel very alone. It's like a monologue. You're no. I still hear you. Don't worry. You're still talking to me. Okay. All right. Go on. <laughs> I'm just saying this is weird. I'm just talking to you while you're peeing. <laughs> you're talking about live stream too. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll go. I gotta go. <laughs> All right. I'm not actually peeing while he's peeing. I can't do this. We're just gonna have to wait. You're just gonna have to watch me. Drink my scotch.
Who has a candle burning back there? What's that about? Sorry, Joe. I couldn't. I couldn't talk while you weren't there. It's too weird. Okay, Lafort's got me on this thing where I have to drink 55 bottles of water a day. So that means I pee all the time, like him. Oh yeah. Does he also have you on like creatine and shit? That makes you pee a lot. No, he says I. Um, he suggests. He isn't like. He's not like commanding me with a whip and like whipping my hand to make me do this. But I, I'm trying to train like Lafort. So um, no creatine. Creatine's overrated. Most pre-workouts have creatine in them already. Yeah, I don't know. He got to read his blog, man. Lefortemans.wordpress.com. I'm like not connected to the internet when I'm in Vegas. I just don't even like. Like I haven't like read two plus two in like like two weeks, which is like weird for me. Like you know, I'm always reading everything that's going on. Not missing much. Don't worry. Nothing really exciting going on there. What was I? Wordpress? I f no, I feel I feel cheated that I didn't show the live stream viewers my pee bottle as I actually went into it. But I feel like that might be illegal in a way, so I don't want to do that on the... We were talking about you on 2 months, 2 million, though. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I had a really good experience. Um, I thought it was really fun. I got, you know, at first it was like a... It was really weird, and I wasn't sort of... I wasn't ready for it at first, and it was kind of overwhelming, but I just got used to it, and and I felt... Uh, I started feeling really comfortable with the cameras and, and everything around, and and... I enjoyed watching the show. I thought like, the show itself, like the production value and everything, was like pretty good, and I, I was like relatively happy with the product. But I also thought like it could have been much better. And I thought if it was like you know a little bit less like trashy reality show and like a little bit more like documentary style, it would have been more interesting. But obviously, that's like my, I mean, obviously, I can't have a, an unbiased opinion about this, and also not even just because I was in the show, but also just as a poker player, I think I would prefer that a more, like, interesting look at, like, the life of a poker player. I mean, those things, I think about it all the time, like, you know, just some of the things that that goes on in the poker world, and it's just that we all take for granted. It's just so, like, fascinating, probably, to the most average people. I mean, it's, like, the amount of money that's exchanging hands, the amount of, like, you know, five, seven-figure equity deals that are being, like, exchanged on, like, over text, you know, just, like, it's a, it's a really crazy world, and, and I kind of wish, like, the public had a little bit more access to it and, and was aware of, like, just, I think it's, like, I think it's really interesting. I think, uh, you know, obviously they have to, they have to, like, they have to, you know, bridge the gap between, like, it can't be, like, too nerdy and, like, niche of, like, a thing. It has to be, you know, for the mass market, because it's on G4, it's not on, like, the, you know, it's not on poker tube. It's, like, a, it had to be on, a, on, a, on cable. So they had to make it like reality show-ish enough that like you could actually hear. Um, I like I said I, I had a really good time with it, and if and we were like kind of we were in negotiate or like we were like talking with the network about season two um, after the first season it was kind of like maybe yes maybe no for a while, and eventually they just told us no, and I was like. We were all just like ready and on board and like completely in for season two if it happened. But you know, now that it's like years gone, I would never do it again. You wouldn't do it again, is that what you're saying? No, no, no. It's just it's different. I'm like a different I'm like a totally different person, you know. Now not, you're you're married, you're you're living in Mexico, you like to go to the beach, work on your tan, cook your cook some food. Work on my tan. Look at this. Well you've been in Vegas for like I don't know, like two weeks. I should, I never ever have a tan, ever. Why? How? Why not? Um, well, my skin has two shades. It's ghostly white, <laughs> or like pink, burnt, like charred to a crisp. <laughs> I live in Mexico. I go to the beach sometimes. I know what happens. It's like I either burn like horrifically, or, or I just have to stay inside and, and wear SPF 100 or whatever, and just and. Uh, I'm, my parents are Israeli, well, my mom's Israeli, my dad, or he was born in Israel, but but I have, like, the Polish genes in me, you know, my dad's side of the family. Um, they're, uh, my mom is, is dark, but my, my dad is, like, pretty white. I, I have his genes, so I, I'm very white. I don't, this is, this is not a, <laughs> you know, the Israeli tan. Yeah, you look pretty, you look pretty pale, I'm going to be honest with you. It's okay. Hey, you know what? Yeah, you're not you're not insulting me. It's okay. I call it like I see it. You know, but I always tell people if you want to improve how you look, get tan. 
That's one of the easiest things you can do besides brush your teeth and. Yep, I mean, I'm sure the big hand looks much better. I just can't do it. It's okay, man. You're married. You don't got to worry about that now. You're yeah. fine. Was that was was that guy Harry on the show Poker Party? The guy Harry Kaza Kaza Kaza. I don't I don't know if it's good, but that's the word. I don't I'm not friends with him, so I can't like comment from like any position of authority. Are you eating like gummy bears or something? You... That's not on the diet. Of course, I'm not eating gummy bears. Okay. Um, I don't know Harry that well. Like we were kind of friends. I fucking knew it was some gummy. <laughs> Okay, it's gummy, it's gummy sweet tarts. I'm allowed to snack once in a while, you know? All right. You know, you can snack with, like, peanuts or, or cashews. All right, I'm, I'm, not your, I'm not your coach. Talk to LaFord about your gummy bears. Um, Make a good point, though. So, Fuck it. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that. Um, I don't know uh, that for sure that, that was him, but that's, like, a word. That's what everyone said that that was Harry, so... Um, I don't know better than anyone else, but that's like the rumor. Um, much better question is who is fake or real? Well, fake or real, for those that don't know, is this guy on Poker Stars. He's been playing for maybe two or three years now. It was suspected he might have been Poker Party, who was this very legendary uh, Poker Stars player who like randomly spring up and play 100 games. But fake or real is like his alter ego who always plays on a lot of cocaine, I think. And he, he... You say he plays on a lot of cocaine? He must. He's one of the worst players I've ever seen. I mean, he like he's been coming back for years. He wins over like a huge temple. No. It doesn't seem possible, but he does. Or he has. I'm not saying he's a winner. I'm not saying he will continue to win. But I'm just saying I've seen I've seen some databases where he's winning. What's that mean? You've seen some untracked databases? Well it's tracked, but yes. No. I'm sure some I, I I I have okay. There's this I, I don't have access to any of this information. Russian PTR we're speaking about, aren't we? What? We're speaking about Russian PTR. Yeah, I don't know shit about this site, but I've like seen screenshots of other people who have this site. I don't know shit about it. It's called Russian PTR. I, I, call, I named it that. Well, whatever. And I'm not just saying that because like I don't want to associate myself with something that's against the rules. I really don't know shit about this. Your hands are clean, my friend. You don't know anything. Well, I just mean like if you know me, I don't like I don't stay in the know about like this type of stuff. I don't I don't know what the hell's going on with that that type of nonsense. Um, but people seem to think that I don't know. I just would love to know who the hell he is. My well, problem. I know there's an account that followed me on Twitter for a bit, Faker Real One hashtag Faker Real underscore one, and it said um, he was this guy Mikhail from. From Canada somewhere, I'm gonna try to find Mikhail Cheryl. He was super elite last year. That's sick. Really? He had the things. He had the the stars. Whatever. Yeah, he there's this, the, there's this account that tweeted pretty similar to, to how I would imagine fake or real is. So I actually think this was him. But a troll account though. What? It could just be a, a fake account. I'm pretty sure it was him. If you read it, you you you, you might suspect the same thing. He doesn't really chat, though. Yeah, I know. It's a weird guy. You know, hopefully I'll be able to get him on a podcast one of these days. Yeah, good one. Hopefully I'll be able to figure out who the fuck he is. He follows two people online. One is Poker Party and one is this other account. So, I don't know. Who knows? Let's go back to some more YouTube questions. I don't want to ask that one. Let's see here. Let me go best scroll down a bit here. People always ask interesting questions. Do you think there will be another poker boom? Socrates asks. Like there was? No. Um, will it maybe make like a surge again? I, I don't know. Why not? Um, I mean, I think poker is like pretty, uh, pretty closely connected with the world economy. You know, like when people have money, poker is going to get better. So I think if like the U.S. economy is like booming or something, that's just like great news for us. Uh, but People like, man, everybody talks about how poker is dying. I just don't see it at all. Like, I mean, I play online PLO and live tournaments as, like, my main source of income, so you can't possibly think poker is dying if you play those games. Um, but, like, I'm, like, you know, 
Oh, my, my friends and I out here, everybody keeps saying that they think that the tournaments so far at the World Series have gotten softer this year. Like, huh. the Millionaire Maker had a record field, you know, the Seniors event had a record field. Like, there's just, like, people, there's just so many people that play poker. Um, and I don't think that, like, like, live poker is not dying at all. Like, live tournaments, like, you go to EPTs, you go to, you go to World Series events, it is not dying. Like, poker is, is booming. It's, it's going really great. Um, you know, online volume, I guess, is, like, down over the last couple of years compared to what it was, I think. I'm not sure. Um, but it being down, like, going down a bit, that doesn't necessarily mean it's dying. It's not like it's going to, it's not like the trend is, like, if it's going like this, it's just going to keep going, I don't think. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's a very complicated question. It's a very weird economy, how it works. I don't understand how the poker economy works completely. I'm sure, like, a company like PokerStars has invested, like, lots of money in, like, researching, like, how poker economy actually works and, and what, you know, what, how the money actually moves and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, people, like I said, people love to complain. People love to bitch and moan about how shit isn't like it was or it's not that good but really like just whatever just deal with it and adapt you know like uh oh you like you can't play five ten no limit online anymore it's too tough pick up a different game or play live poker or something i don't know you know like it's just the situations just change like it's just there's always going to be a game that's best to be playing um you know right now you know pretty good at I'm like, okay, oh, and I'm going to PLO, whatever. Um, I would like to at some point get good at mixed games so that it gives me more flexibility in, like, what games I can play. And if at one, at some point in the future, you know, like, people think about poker, like, poker is poker going to boom again? Like, where it's just, no, you're never going to be able to, like, play Party 1020 in 2005 again. It's just never going to happen, you know? It's mm -hmm. not going to be, like, that unbelievable, like, crazy action where no one has a clue anymore. It's going to be tougher than that. It's going to, and it's especially tough for people to, like, enter poker. You know, for people who, like, who are already poker players, I think it's, like, fine. But it's going to be, it's really tough for somebody to, like, learn how to play poker now and, like, shoot up the ranks and become a high-stakes player. That's, like, brutally tough. You know? I would agree with that. I mean, I've been telling people for a couple of years now when everyone's, like, poker's dying. I'm, like, confused. I, I mean, for the most part, I mean, I'm doing better than, almost better than ever in a way. I mean, so... That's the kind of thing I always say. I'm like, I mean, yeah, like people are getting better, but at the same time, that just should be motivation for you to keep continuing to get better yourself. So, you know, like don't look at everyone else getting better around you and, and kind of woe in your own misery and be like, well, fuck, this sucks, you know. Well, that just should be encouraging you to improve yourself and, you know, try to get better. Like, you know, like what happened with you. You know, you, you saw you're breaking even. Well, you, you had a decision to make. You know, do I want to continue to break even? Do I move back to the United States? Or do I want to really bust my ass, work out my game, and get better? And obviously with you, you've seen the results. You know, you, you were having one of the best years, you said, you know, as far as doing well, so. Yeah. I think it um, couldn't be, you know, that, that's. Yeah, I mean. I, I mean, it's, it's not, like, I, there's, there's like, I mean, I, I do some coaching in program. I, I try and do, like, less than I used to, but I, I used to do a lot. And, you know, I had this one student, um, who I still have, who is from uh, Lithuania. And I started coaching him like a year ago, or two years ago, maybe, that uh, he was paying like, maybe like 25 cents, 50 cents, or 50 cent dollar in the limit. And he was grinding, like, he was a huge grinder, and he was making like, you know, 30K a year or something like that, which is like very respectable for those stakes, obviously. Yeah, that's definitely pretty good, those stakes. Um, and I thought he was like, quite good, you know. I like I, I like realized it right away. Like for a low stakes player, he has quite a good understanding of poker. And I, I pretty much told him, you gotta like, like you're you're solidly beating these games. You have like a really big win rate those games, and you're probably gonna make like two fives or something like that, and then maybe be moving up. Like, Why don't you? Do that? And he's like, you don't understand. I live in Lithuania. Okay, I make thirty thousand dollars a year. With like very little worry, you know, I make more than a doctor here. Yeah, <laughs> he's like, this is my salary right now is like fantastic for where I live. 
So it just it like it made me realize that like like people like like, like twenty percent, fifty percent as like the, like take this level where it's just like these players who don't have money or you know like like for bus drivers or something. But like the people who are playing for a living at those stakes who are like fucking balling in wherever they're from, you know, like the, this is like if you live in like the right place, playing twenty five cent, fifty cent, and, be, and like you can like be a, like a pretty good player and play those games. So like, it made me realize how tough it, it would be to move up these days, you know, like back in the day when I was playing like five dollar sitting goes in like when I was in high school, you know. Obviously, there were no professional poker players in those games. You know? Mm. What are you looking at? I was looking at where Lithuania is because I kind of want to move there now. <laughs> um, there, basically, you know, I was like, when I played Five Dollar City, it was in like 2004. Of course, there were no professional poker players in those days. There were probably barely any professional poker players at like Fifty Dollar City goes in those days, right? Yeah. Now, I'm talking about like twenty-five cent, fifty cent. There's a guy who's like in the top income bracket in his country playing those games, and he's like, you know, he's like legitimately good at poker. Like he's not like he's not like just exploiting the fish stick. He's like he's good at no limit, and he's playing twenty five cent, fifty cent. I mean, since then he's moved up, and he plays like two five now, and he's going to make like more, you know, six figures this year, and he's going to like, you know, be richer than the president or whatever. But he's like, you know, like, <laughs> what saying like it's 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 just weird because the you know it's a global economy, so like what happens is like. You know, for like the American who, like, in order to make a reasonable living, needs to be making like, you know, 50, 60k a year playing poker for it to be like worth it. It's not like that if you live in some other countries. Like, you can be making a lot less money and be doing okay. So that makes like the low stakes games pretty damn tough. So, you know, it's just like a one weird angle of how the poker economy is. That's a really weird angle. It's something I've never thought of before. That, you know, these people are. Yes, there's professional poker players playing like 20, 10, 25 cents, 50 cents. Yeah, right. I mean, well, technically, I was playing for a living when I started playing, and I was playing 10 cents, 25 cents. I just make like $1,000 a month. and So I was playing for a living then, but. That was like beer beer. Like, that was like in college or whatever. That was like when I was 22, 23, so like eight years ago, seven years ago, something like that. $1,000 a living off that? I what? You were living off a thousand dollars a month. The fuck you mean? I was rich. Thousand dollars a month. When you were twenty-three, were you living in your mom's basement? Wait, twenty-two. I was rich. I was living in Chicago. My rent was two hundred eighty-one dollars a month. I I ate what? McDonald's. You in the ghetto? I mean, what the hell? Well, you got to see my bedroom. It was it was the biggest bedroom. That's not. It's like a very, a very. It's like a size of a bathroom. My kind of my bedroom was at the time. It was. I had three roommates. Uh, I mean, one of them I knew. Two. Of them. What? That was like less than minimum wage. Like you would have been better off, like, you know, working as like a, like, you know, flipping burgers. No, I, I did that when I was sixteen. That that was a fun job. I met a lot of I met a lot of nice women at that job, but that wasn't the kind of job I'd probably be doing when I was twenty two. Also, I mean, it helps you move. It helps you get better. And I was playing a bunch of hours a day, and I was trying to make it up to twenty five cent, fifty cent, the mean streets of fifty NL. And I remember, yeah, I made fifteen hours. Fifteen hundred dollars one month, and I, I was I was rich as I've ever been in my life at that time. Those were the good old days, man. Those were the happy days. If you're making a bunch of money, when you know ten thousand dollars was like a huge amount of money, then obviously it's all good. I, I, that's that's how it was when I I did my first prop bet. I played the the six hundred thousand hands in a month, and I made twenty seven thousand dollars from that. And my bankroll before the month was like six thousand dollars. So I like. Did you lose money though while you were playing? No, I crushed. This was back before PT. This is back before Table Ninja, before Hold'em. I mean, I didn't use Hold'em Manager at the time, so I just played six hundred thousand hands and I made like five or six k at the tables playing. What stakes were you playing? Uh, ten cent, twenty five cent, twenty five cent, fifty cent, and fifty cent one dollar. Wow. It was a mixture of them all. Great then. Not like a Rubu. What? Not like a Rubu. <laughs> Poor guy. Poor guy. Poor guy. Poor, you know, that's what happens. You do some extra drugs one day, you think you can do a 450,000 hands in 45 days prep bet. And for those that don't know, we're talking about Urubu111. Uh, I did a couple podcasts. I previewed his prep bet, I, and then I did a recap on his prep bet. It was a prep bet where he was he wanted to play 450,000 hands in a month. 
and finished with a profit at mid stakes on Poker Stars, and he gave up after like fucking five days. I mean, it was the biggest joke prop I've ever seen. He lost a bunch of money. He lost his he lost his countrymen's money on the Brazilian forums. They were all side betting on him, and the only winner was fucking Caramon. So, you know, go figure. Caramon ends up winning out of that whole deal somehow. He runs good. So, the weird thing is like. I mean, he's good. Like, I've played with him. He's pretty good. But mid stakes PLO is fucking tough to beat. The rate is just enormous. So, like, even if he's, like, solidly, like, like better than his opponent, he needs to be winning at, like, a pretty damn big win rate to, like, be a favorite in this bet. Because you co- you combine, like, all the... Like, even if he hits the 500K, like... It's just, like, I mean, you know, no money in PLO, everybody's raked. You know the thread, right? Like... For sure. So wait, it sounds like you'd be interested in betting against uh, one of us in the in the live stream right now if they were going to try this bet one day. One of who? If, if one of us might try this bet one day, one of us being me, I might I might attempt this eventually once I relocate out of the country. Sounds uh, like you think out you think out about. No offense, but if it requires you to win, then yes, I might be interested in betting against. It's, it's just it's fucking. Look, you're not going to play your best when you're playing five hundred thousand hands in a mob. Well, technically, you know, I've played that amount before in a month, right? Uh, yeah, but, you know... <laughs> I know, you know, I've done it before. I, I mean, I've played four three thousand hands in a month, so I've done it before. I, I barely lost at that time. I didn't actually lose too much. Obviously, that was two or three years ago. Games are a lot different, but... I feel like I have a, a decent handle on... Uh, I don't know. Like I said, I know it's challenging, and I'm, I would need better than two-to-one odds, but it might be something I'm interested in trying. Isn't the point of the, the no money in PLO, everybody's raped thread, that basically nobody wins at mid-stakes PLO, and it's all just you only can win from rake pack? I don't. I've been playing. I've been playing those stakes for the past like six, seven, eight months. Only I stopped playing high stakes about six, seven months ago, and I can confirm that you can make plenty of money after the rake. Oh, I mean, I'm sure you can win. I'm not. I don't mean like literally you can't, but it's like. It's really tough. Like it's it's you know. I don't want to say anything about that. Yes, it's hard. If you play, if you want to play online PLO and you're good, don't come. Don't come to the don't come to the untracked Euro sites. Don't play on, on, Bovada or eight 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 or iPoker. I will confirm that. Thought. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk about the mid six games anymore. Rent is two hundred eighty dollars a month in Chicago. Yes, it was for a terrible place and the most rundown place ever. And I had a mattress on the floor. And I had interesting times on that match on the floor. Do you coach any on one-on-one PLO, Anski? Um, I haven't done much PLO coaching, and like I said, I'm kind of trying to do less coaching than I used to. I used to do a lot, and I still have some like leftover students that I am honoring. You know, obviously, I'm continuing to coach. Um, but I don't know. I'm just you know, I stopped making videos like two or three years ago. I'm Slowly starting to just stop coaching. It's just, I don't know. Uh, I know what you're saying. Like a certain somebody, somebody the other day asked me for PLO coaching at the Rio, like a mid stakes PLO player, and I'd be like somewhat interested. It's just that like, I don't know. Like what do you like? You know, you might make videos and stuff, and it's just, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I'm not going to say no, but uh, I would think about it. All right. Uh, one of our only female listeners, Alex Walker, asks, he knows I really enjoy doing box jumps when I'm at the gym getting my basketball legs in shape. How many box jumps can you do, Anski? <laughs> How many box jumps? I don't know. I, I've, been, I've been doing CrossFit for a while now, so I do quite a bit. You can probably do a pretty good, pretty good amount then. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have, like, a max rep number. I don't know. Um, but... Uh, um, certainly, that type of exercise is not my strength. What's your What's your strongest strength in, in when you're doing CrossFit then? Mm, like in Cross, I'm pretty bad at CrossFit. Like, like when it, like I do CrossFit in 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 Playa, and it's all like like I mean, it's, I mean CrossFit in general, like the type of people you get there are not like super strong. They're usually like pretty skinny and like really like you know good shape, but like not. They're not, like, huge, but they're, like, they can do, like, really, they're good at, like, the wads. Um, I'm, like, not really like that. 
Yeah. All right. It was a bit of a lag there, so I missed your answer. But I'm guessing you said you're just you're not you're not that's not your strength when it comes to. Uh, yeah, I'm not too great at box jumps. I'm better at just you know bench pressing. All right. Um, let's see here. I'm scrolling up through the comments area. Yeah, talking about working out after before it's been on the podcast. It's like. <laughs> Before I've been I've been inciting a little bit of a riot in the um, in the two plus two low content thread. I because I so I talked about Lafort's blog in there, knowing full well that there would be people that obviously like disagree with. Because you when know, it comes to working out, everyone's got a real strong opinion if they do work out, and they're they're not changing their mind for the most part. So I plugged Lafort's blog in there and then incited a nice interesting conversation, and then it started to die out. So I decided to spark it back up again and post something else and. Lafort's got to leave uh, a couple of real nice, um, lengthy comments in the thread, and I'm, I, I'm, I get happy reading them because. Health and fitness forum. No, I'm talking about in two plus two high six PLO forum. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I was, I wanted to let people know about the blog, and I want to spark up some conversation with people, and the conversation's been interesting. It's so hard to argue with Lafort about fitness because you're just like, no, nah, man, you're wrong, but, you know, you look like that, so I don't know. It's like tried and tested all his theories, which is what's good, what's good about you know him when he when he speaks here when he's writes something. That's one of the reasons why, you know, when I ask him questions, he gives me pretty precise answers. He's been there, he's done that, he's put in the work. So, yeah, I mean, Laporte's Laporte's awesome. He's just a super smart guy. He's very good at what he does. He's 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 good at he's good at the things he's good at. I know. That's what I, that's what I try to tell people. I mean, I might not be good at a lot of things. But things I'm I'm good at. I'm I'm very good at. So. As long as you stick to those three or four things that you're exceptional at. What? It's good to be a specialist. It's good to like find something that you're good at and just go at it, you know? Exactly. Clayton Mooney, friend of the podcast, says, Have either of you have either of you guys known any SMG MTT grinders that switch to six max and heads up PLO? I'm strongly considering it come early next year. I don't know anyone personally, but I would always, I probably would suggest trying it out. Have you, do you know anyone that's uh, done that, made that switch? From like tournaments to 6 max PLO? I mean, I don't know the offhand. I mean, I played a lot of tournaments and 6 max PLO. Certainly, you know, in terms of like being a good no limit player. Which does not necessarily sound necessarily synonymous with being a good sit and go and tournament player. It would give you some like somewhat of like a a big starting step for going into PLO. Um, I, I mean, I mean, poker's poker. You know, like there are a lot. There's within, within any game, there's going to be a ton of crossover skills that that apply and. You know, the parameters of the game, the rules of the game, the way the equities work in the game is just like one thing you have to deal with. But like a lot of the other things you have to deal with are the same from game to game. It's just analyzing ranges and, and, and doing math and learning about how equity is run against each other and, and then and then from there you you know, you explore the game and you figure shit out. So um, if anybody who's like an expert at any form of poker would probably have I'm not gonna say an easy time, but we'll have we'll, you know, have a reasonable uh, climb to get good at whatever next game they want to learn. It's not going to be like, it's not, you're not starting from scratch. It's not going to be like when you, when you first learned how to play poker. Because you're going to be, instead of learning brand new concepts and like learning to apply them, you're going to be kind of transferring concepts. You know? mm. So it sounds like you think he should go ahead and try that. Which I, I, I agree. I think if you want to try it, the only way you're really going to know is just get out there, put in the hours, and try. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of value in, in knowing multiple multiple games because you never know how the poker economy is going to shift and change, and maybe whatever game you're playing is going to die in, like, X amount of years, and then something else is going to be big. I mean, there's always value in diversifying yourself as a poker player and being, being better at, you know, being better at multiple games because... You never know what situation you're going to be in. You never know when you're going to need some other skill. So sure. Are you, are you um, what Max asked? Max, Ch you know Chisness? Um, I don't know if we've ever met, but I mean, Max, Max asks, I think he was talking about living in 
I think this is a troll question a bit. Yes, but do they have wild salmon there? Wild salmon in Playa del Carmen. I'm guessing they have wild salmon there. No, they don't have wild salmon. They don't have shit there. That's the worst part about living there. Wait, they don't have anything there? No, you have local fish. You have like you have good like uh, Caribbean fish. So you get like um, you get like a lot of different types of snapper. There's some there's some Caribbean tuna, which is like it's good because it's tuna, but it's like nowhere near as good as like Pacific tuna. Um, there is. Um, Bokinete, I don't know what it, what it is in English. That's just like one of the big local fish there. It looks kind of weird. It has like has like a big forehead and it comes down and has like a tiny nose. It's a kind of weird looking fish. Um, but it's like a, you know, it's like this big. It's not that big. It's a, it's a pretty big fish. Um, and there's really good shellfish. There's like really good shrimp. Like the shrimp there is excellent. And the uh, squid and octopus is good. Um, and they have a lot of lobster, but it's not. It's not really good. It's not like Maine lobster. It's not like you know North Atlantic lobster. Mm -hmm. uh, but salmon, forget about salmon. You don't, you don't get any salmon in Central America. It's just, it's, it all comes from like Norway and shit. Can you get you can get chicken and steak, correct? Sorry. Chicken and steak are are there, correct? Um, you can get really good chicken. The beef is like pretty bad there. It's like either I mean you can't like I'm pretty into into like American grass fed beef. You know that's like yeah. what I eat. Um, but uh, you don't get that there. Like they, um, the the beef that they get is either like some like big market uh, American corn fed beef garbage that like you know it's it's fine it tastes good um, or they have um, I've gotten some like Mexican beef that's like it's grass fed because that's just what they have there. But it's like the leanest, like most malnourished, malnourished, like looking like beef you've ever seen. Like it's so lean, like I, you know, it's it's really like pathetic looking. But the chicken, you can get really good chicken. I've had like excellent chicken. I better I better embrace. I've been eating a lot of chicken lately, and rather than steak. And I, it sounds like if I was to go to play, I should enjoy or embrace the chicken. For the most part, the best stuff there is the fish, the shellfish. And the chicken, in terms of like the natural ingredients, that's like one of the only things I don't like down there, though, is that like just the food you know, options. Yeah, like I, I love cooking and I love like exploring different ingredients and trying out new things that I've never had before, and, and you know going to the fish. Like I had like in Toronto, I had like the absolute best, best, best butcher and like the best fish monger, and I was just like always getting like the best stuff. And like I'm in Vegas now, and I've been doing. I, I've been just like loving going like Whole Foods. There's a Whole Foods in Hot Dog County, you know. Like, <laughs> you, you, want, you want fish? You go to the fish guy. You want uh, you want some vegetables? You go to the vegetable store. You know, there's <laughs> you, go to, you go to the guy with the fish outside of his of his shop or outside of his. You can, go to, you can go to like Walmart, and you get all that stuff, but it's like really low quality garbage. That's what I feed my dog. Oh. I feed Walmart. Man. You're a nice you're a nice owner, my friend. Yeah, we don't feed him dog food anymore. We just feed him, we feed him meat and, and vegetables or left, leftovers from us. He's he lost fifteen pounds since we did that. <laughs> That's kinda of ridiculous actually. Yeah, it was like immediate too. It took like three months and he, he lost like he lost fifteen percent of his body weight. Let's uh let's get some Twitter here. Alright, I'll go through a couple of Twitter ads here. Uh, David Danafu. He's a two plus to wrote. He said, "Watching live podcast hosted by Joe with Gust Ansky. Good job so far. Thank you, David. Daniel at the in group. Hey Joe, tell Danny that the first training video I ever watched was him on Poker Savvy back in the day. Wow, that was a long time. How long ago was that? I don't even remember that. Um, it was quite a while ago, I guess. Uh, I probably did that until like." I don't know, like 2007 or something. Wow, that is very long ago. Yeah, savvy? I've never heard of that site. It doesn't exist anymore. It's like right. an right now. Wow. Okay. That's was that, you said it was Daniel at the in group or whatever. Correct. Yeah, that guy. Um, shout out. What's up, man? <laughs> he um, he always every time I like post anything about poker, he says something to the effect of like, uh, you know, do it for the Jews, like. Because we're both Jewish, you know. Yeah, like go Jews in poker or whatever. So I always look for that guy, you know, for, for that. 
Yeah, he's cool. I like interacting with him on Twitter for sure. Let's, uh, Asani, your roommate. Yeah. Even though you're not a member of the tribe? What'd you say? You're not Jewish, are you? No. Oh, I'm impressed that he, he branches out to the non Jews also. I think he likes the podcast. You know, I mean, he's, yeah, respect for the the good Gentiles. Yeah, he enjoys he enjoys the podcast. Uh, Asani, your roommate asks, ask Kadani to answer this Jeopardy question, please. Fuck off! I know what he just stop. I know what he's gonna fucking say. I can't. I we haven't brought it up yet, but this is what just happened right before we did the podcast. We were watching Jeopardy downstairs, and um, one of the categories was poker, and Aaron. A. Jones brought said like, "What's the chances that we don't get one of this right?" I'm like, "It's one in a hundred. Like, we're gonna get it right. I bring every question right 100 percent of the time." The category was poker on Jeopardy. You know, it wasn't like it's poker, okay? And I so he's like, "All right, I'll take that bet." And I'm like, "Fine, a dollar to a hundred. He looks in his wallet. He doesn't have a dollar. He's like, "I only have ten. I'm like, "Fine, a thousand to ten. Anyway, the five hundred dollar question is about pie gal. What the fuck? It was about Pi Gal. And, I, and we didn't know the fucking answer. It was the answer was <laughs> identical or something. So I lost a thousand fucking dollars laying. <laughs> this happened like like an hour ago. And I was so fucking enraged that I, I, I like turned off. I, we had to stop watching. I like had to storm out. The question had literally nothing to do with poker. It's a complete fucking. It's complete bullshit. Well, the question is want to get an edge in Pi Gal? Take this role in which you win all copy hands. Monopoly games have one too. What was the answer? Do you know? The bank. No, oh, bank. bank. I've never played fucking Pi Gal. Well, I'm sorry you lost $1,000 to. It's completely ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Don't bet, would you make a thousand to one? No, it was a hundred to one. It was a hundred to one. Oh, hundred to one. Okay, I guess. $10, sorry, it was ten dollars at hundred to one. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure you could have made that bet at ten to one, but you know, hundred to one, whatever, it's fine. Too. Also, the the four hundred dollar question we almost missed too, and the answer was check. Wow. It was something so simple. It was like, but it was just worded weird. It was like, in order to see the next card when your opponent bets or raises, you can call, but if they don't, you can do this. Free. You told me the answer. It seems easy to me now. At the time, I might not. I might have been confused as well. I simplified it. It's possible it was actually that easy. And we're just <laughs> All right, we'll do uh, one more. We got one more. Uh, Sky reg problems. I think sky reg problems. You know stars reg problems, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I yes. You've heard of his tweets. We had him on the podcast, and it was interesting. Did you know her about that? I heard it was a disaster. Yeah, it was. A, it was. It was a self-admitted disaster in his end. But I think we have a, a twin who goes by the name of Sky Reg Problems on Twitter. And I'm not sure if he, I don't know what Sky actually is. I'm not sure if it's a casino or a website. But he asked for a shout out. So, out of respect for the shout out system in the world, I'm going to say hello to him. And I hope that he's as aggressive as Stars Reg Problem is on Twitter. Let's uh let's do let's uh we'll we'll get into the hands that I have here and then we'll probably uh get the podcast wrapped up here. I think we're at about an hour and a half or something like that. So well, and then for the hands, you know, as as you know, I like to just go over the hands in a pretty uh broad spectrum if that's the right word. I actually don't think that was the right word, but it's okay. And whatever you want to add to it, uh, comment any of the players. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So you can, you'll be able to see the hand on my screen the whole time, okay? All right. All right, so this first hand is a hand that I mentioned earlier. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Cool, okay. Oh, that's me, that's weird. No, don't do that. All right, go back to Danny for a second. Well, that was freaky. Okay, um, where am I here? No problem one. Okay. All right, now we got it up. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in here. This first hand is the hand we talked about earlier. And... For those that haven't seen it, it's with uh, Daldar in uh, the power the power 14 big blind stacks at 50 100. Um, I have to uh, read the handout just because so people listening on audio won't be able to see the hand. So Daldar has got 14 big blinds and the hand starts 50 100 four handed. It's between uh, Ansky, G, 
Eilar. So Eilar opens up to pot under the gun with, like I said, 14 big blinds, and uh, Anski three bets the button to pot, and Jeans flat calls the big blind, and he's got 50 big blinds. So the, the interesting thing in this hand is you, you have king, king, a3 with one suit. Deldar has ace, queen, queen, six with one suit. And Jeans ends up flatting the three bet with two, seven, nine, ten double suited. So he has two, seven, nine, ten double suited. Deldar opens the pot, you three bet, and Jeans flat calls in the big blind with 50 big blinds. Now, the flat doesn't necessarily matter too much, but what do you think about his call from your, your spectrum here? Um, I'm pretty sure his call is pretty bad. Uh, we talked about this on Twitter a bit, uh, me and Jeans and Cole. It was mostly the two of them talking, but I chimed in a little bit. Um, it was kind of weird. Like he, he did some analysis on the hand, which was like it was, he kind of did like the exact right analysis about like how to figure out this spot, like how much money you make. Except he did this like one like kind of brutal flaw in it that made it all worthless was that he just used our exact hand, which is like ridiculous because he basically like super used us this hand. You know, he had like he has both live suits. He doesn't have like a single card dead, you know. Like we don't have any do seven, nine, ten, and there's only one spade dead, and there's and there's only one diamond dead, or there's two diamond deads, I guess, two dead diamonds. Um, but his suits are completely alive. Um, I mean, we don't, you know, like his his hand obviously versus our two specific hands does pretty well. Um, when he like in Pilo, when you're like the short stack and you have the opportunity. To get in in a get it all in, in a three way pot where there's going to be a third pl- the, the, when the second and third players both have a bunch of money and they can bet each other out that's an incredibly good opportunity for you. But in this case, you know him and I are both playing 5k effective, and he's going to have to play a side pot where he's like guaranteed to be a dog. Um, since assuming like basically, you can basically assume Deldar is all in since he has uh, he has like one. 13th pot or whatever going into the flop or 114th pot. Um, so he's pretty much, Delaware's basically all in, and then I'm going to shove the flop 100% of the time, basically giving him, you know, one to one or one to one odds in the side pot. Um, so, like, getting him as like a 40% dog in the, in the side pot is like kind of brutal. Um, I don't, he did the math, and I don't remember offhand what, what his minimum equity, what he needs. To get it in the side pot, what his average equity will be, but that's basically the way you do this uh, using Oz Oracle. You calculate what your minimum equity is, and then based on what all, all the times that you call it off with that minimum equity, what your average equity will be. Um, and when he did the math, like his hand specifically in this spot makes like a lot of big blinds. Um, but if you start plugging in like some ranges for Deldar and I, um, especially like some linear ranges where Deldar has like, I mean, for the most part. Oz Oracle will handle this situation really well because what it basically treats all preflop ranges as is, is, is like totally linear. So it like breaks like Rainbow Kings is like significantly better than like seven, eight, nine, ten double suited. When obviously like seven, eight, nine, ten in in, in like practice is going to make you more money. Um. So basically, um. I think his hand is like a little bit too weak. It's not like as bad as it seems. I think because like some people would like look at this and think it's absurd. I think his hand is like a little bit too weak. Like having a deuce is like real bad. Like even having like a five here would make like a difference. Uh, like just generally like wheel cards are just brutal. Um, having like a six would probably make it okay. I mean generally like double suited runs, especially like double suited runs where you're not likely to be have any of your cards covered when you're up against like big cards, big cards in a three way pot is going to be great. Especially if you're in Deldar spot, though, like it's a little bit—it's not nearly as good when you're in Gene's spot because he has to play the side pot where I'm gonna shove and he's gonna have to, like I said, he's gonna have to call it off, getting one to one basically. Well, it's not one to one because he has some equity in the side, but or he has some equity in the main pot. But you know what I mean, like he in the in the side pot, he's he's not getting a good price basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Like these spots, I'm are like probably like my weakest part in PLO. I'm not like great at like these the, the, the multi-way pots, like calculating the, um, like knowing offhand like what my what my like middle suited middle double suited run is going to have against like their likely ranges. Um, one thing that he has going for him though is that he, he's right, and that Deldar and I are both really likely to have like linear ranges here. Um, 
like because Deldar limps with this stack, and I would assume he's more likely to be limping his stuff like his like middle runs and like his stuff that's not going to be an equity favorite over like over hands that are going to play a big pot here. The hands that also like are never going to be like worse than forty percent against most ranges, so he's going to be limping with like a lot of his uh, middle double suited run. I mean, maybe like middle double suited runs he's potting because that's like strong enough. But you know, if he has like Jack ten seven eight single suited or something, he might limp here. So that, that that's like working in Dune's favor. That he's much more likely to have like ace big 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 or ace ace pair or essentially a hand he had basically ace queen queen six. Yeah, exactly what he had, and obviously because of his stack, I'm getting an kind of. I mean, I'm not get. I'm not like. I'm not like, three betting like four, five, six, seven or something, but I'm three betting like a lot of hands that are, um, you know. My hand like weak kings, uh, you know, probably some queens, um, you know, something like ace jack jack single suitor. I might. Yeah, just, a lot of times you're not three betting, even like a seven, eight, nine. So even the higher run runs, you're probably not three betting. No, I mean, I'm not really going to three-bet hands. Like, this is a spot where you should just be, like, completely linear. Like, why would you ever three-bet hand that's not going to be favored against the brain? Yeah, exactly. You're, he's always going to realize his equity. So what's the point? There's no deception. There's no deceptive value in three-betting mm. uh, those cards. There's absolutely no equity edge in the three of those cards. Um, there's certainly no balance because he's not raised folding um, ever. You know, you're just getting it in with, a bad, with that equity. Yeah. Well, if you guys, if anyone's out there listening, you want to see, because Jeans did comment a bunch on this. You can go to his Twitter. It's at Jeans89, and go back maybe a couple weeks, and he had a conversation, like you said, with Cole, with CTS, and also I think with the Ford a bit too, where he he wrote a bunch of uh, replies just as far as what he was thinking. And I and I, you know, when I looked at the hand, I was like, you know, what what the, was he thinking? But when he explained it, I mean. No, he, he made a reasonable argument for it. I, I agree. Yeah, I think he was like, a little bit off, though, in his analysis, because he just used our hand, which is just ludicrous. Like, using our hands is just silly. Like, we have, like, we both have hearts, so, like, the hearts are, like, really, like, not that live. Um, there's, like, all of his cards are live, all of his suits are live. It's just, it's not, like, the right way to do it, I don't think. Yeah, I didn't really look too much at, at the actual equation he did, but, like, as you said, you know, if you use the exact hands, I mean, it's like literally the perfect spot. And even in the perfect spot, I mean, I, I think he said how much money he was making from it. I, I have to go back and read it, but I mean, it seems like there's better situations. But at the same time, when you get to these stakes, there are some. These are the kind of situations that you know can add a couple, add some to your win rate, which is for what it's worth. I think for what it's worth, I think Jeans is like extremely good. I think he's like one of the one of the best right for, right for sure. I, so if I think he made a mistake, it's like you know. Debatable, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely. You know, who knows? Who knows who's right, who's wrong, really, in, in, in this situation. So, well, uh, we'll we'll get to the next hand. I think this hand's got you in it. Oh no, this doesn't. Where's the hand? Did I have another hand with the money? But I had six. Um, it's only a five. Okay, so I picked up five. All right. So this hand is at twenty-five fifty zoom. It's between uh, sauce one, two, three, three, eight. Three just absolute legends of online poker. I know, right? So N Channing is at this. It's N Channing, Sauce, CTS. Well, N Channing and, and Stickman, of course. Stickman. I, N Channing's cool, whatever. Stickman, you know, fuck that guy. Stickman's a fucker, for sure. <laughs> I taxed in at this table. I taxed in and playing more PLO. I don't know too much about his PLO game, but I'm assuming he's probably picking it up fairly quickly. Uh, I talked to Ike like, a lot about PLO, and he is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I have no, I have no doubt he'll. he'll you know, if he keeps playing, he'll, he'll definitely improve pretty fast. But this hand, I think, a game like PLO especially suits someone like Ike. Ooh, well, he's just not a field player. He's just like a pure theory player and math guy, and he just is extremely good at that aspect, and that's what makes you good at PLO, basically. Well, this hand's interesting. It's actually between Sauce and CTS. So uh, the hand is 165 big blinds effective. We're at 2550. So Sauce opens for pot in middle position with ace, jack, ten, seven with three hearts. Uh, CTS calls in position on the button with ace, ten, ten, nine with ace high diamonds. Ike three bets the small blind with a 46 big blind stack and sauce and CTS both defend. So the flop comes jack, eight, seven, rainbow. So CTS flops the nuts with the backdoor diamond draw 
and sauce flops top and bottom pair with a backdoor heart draw and a blocker to the nuts. So I choose to check. Sauce bets about one one fourth potty, about six fifty into twenty three hundred dollars. And CTS decides to slow play his straight, and he calls. Now the turn comes a nine, so it's seven, eight, nine. Jack brings backdoor hearts. So Sauce has a straight, and CTS has a straight, and Sauce also has top and bottom pair and a nut flush draw. He makes a very good turn card, basically for a hand. So he bets again. He bets nineteen hundred into thirty-six hundred. A little more than half pot, and once again, CTS calls. The river is gets weird. Eight, nine, nine, jack. So all full houses got there at this point if CTS did have a set. But they both have a straight, and CTS does have a blocker to trips because he has a nine in his hand. So Sauce goes all in for about 4,800 into 7,500, and CTS apparently snap calls. Now... It's an interesting hand. What are your thoughts on this hand when you when you see us initially? Um, I don't know. It seems kind of standard by both, to be honest. Um, I mean, I guess flops. I mean, uh, flop sizing seems good by sauce on this type of board when you have Ike with. Uh, I guess he has like fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred going into the flop, or fifteen fifty. Um. So Ike has like less than like he, Ike has fifteen hundred basically going to spot. So having that sizing seems really good by Sauce because it gives him the option first of all of or it gives him at least the perceived option of shoving if Ike check shoves. Mm -hmm. um, also, this board is just kind of like a lockdown board. There's no like draws really. Like you don't expect people to call with like the low end straight draws in this board. Um, so on this board texture. It, it seems like a good sizing by Sauce. I certainly wouldn't go much bigger with my bluffs or my monsters. Um, also, his hand specifically, it's like probably good for this because he can just easily fold if CTS raises, and if I gets it in, he's just like super snap call, easy, you know, getting five to one or whatever, four to one. Yeah, very happy um, to get in first. Like, sorry. I said he'd be very happy to get it in just first Ike with his hand because he. Has very strong hands, especially against Ike's. I think check. Well, yeah, I mean his hands not that strong, but it's just it's it's strong enough to get it in against against a two third pot uh, stack, and it's also quite vulnerable again in a three way pot. You know, like pretty much any over card is bad for him. Uh, a ten is bad for him. You know, uh, an eight is bad for him. Like he has there's a quite a few terrible uh, runouts for him. So like just getting it all in now against Ike would be good. He doesn't want like this pot to be really checked. Um, turn seems quite standard by both players. Uh, it's basically, Sauce is just going to have CTS free rolling here a lot uh, when he has two pair and a, and a, and a nut flush draw. So he certainly wants to put money in the pot. CTS, um, I think calling, just calling is good. In the, I mean, he can get it in against some Jack Tens with with uh, with no free rolls, but that's pretty unlikely. Like it's I don't know. I think the turn is just like standard Robo players. Um, river is like slightly interesting by sauce. I mean I mean Cole has to fucking snap the river when he has nine, ten, ten. Um, he's blocking tons of full house combos and he's also He's blocking tons of cool house combos, and it's not like it's not like uh, Sauce bets turn with like sets that aren't straights, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like Sauce has like eight seven seven five or something like that. Um, well, maybe some of the lesser sets like that. But anyway, a Sauce doesn't have like pocket jacks here. Is what I'm saying. Um, I think I think Cole's play in the whole hand is quite standard. Uh, slow play on this flop is clearly good versus small bet because Sauce's range is going to be kind of, it's not going to be wide, but like, I mean, it's wide enough to include jacks and sevens with a gut shot. Um, that, I mean, Cole's equity against Sauce here is he hasn't like absolutely smashed. There's basically no real bad turn cards. Um, obviously, board pairs aren't good, but they're not even like that bad, but he still gets to call at least one more bet and get to the river. Um, 
it seems like a really good spot to slow play. Also because like Ike or uh, Sauce might have well first of all Ike might shove and then he traps Sauce and Sauce decides to like just get it in with Jack Eight or something, or even if Sauce decides to just call a flop with Jack Eight and then Cole can rip. Um, and it's just he, his hand just isn't that vulnerable. So slow playing this spot is like probably good. He also balancing this time that he Cole just has so many hands that want to just call this spot. Not so many, but he has like plenty of hands that just want to call this spot. So balancing for when he the times when he has the nuts is fine. I mean, it's Jack Seven Eight Rainbow. I don't know. I think both players played it well. I think uh, Sauce is playing the river. I guess he's trying to get Cole to sometimes fold a straight. Not a queen high for the jack high straight. Mm-hmm. Other people are going to enjoy hearing you talk about hands far more than they enjoy me talking about some of these hands. Why do you say that? <laughs> because you go much more into hand than I do. I'm like, yeah, you can slow play this flop sometimes. I'm not <laughs> well, you know what? Like, it's just like when you when you make a decision to slow play a flop, you can't just think about like, what, should I slow play this flop or not? You have to think about like, why do I want to raise this flop? You can't just justify. It. You have, to slow play. You, know, you have to justify the act of doing the other thing also. But no, I, I, meant, I meant that as far as like when I talk strategy about hands on here, I don't like to get too much into any, any, any anything, any street specific. I just usually, uh, but the, get, the people that listen to the podcast, they really enjoy the strategy. Lafort, when he talked about some hands, he got pretty in-depth about some of them as well. So. Lafort's just, I mean, he's, he's awesome. <laughs> like so I'm not surprised. I know. I enjoyed. I, I'm. They're gonna. They'll enjoy hearing you talk about the hands as well. They're gonna. Now they're gonna want you to make more. Make more videos and stuff like that about PLO because you obviously have a really great way of explaining your your thought process. You know, as you look over a hand. So. Let's uh. These are hands. Is that interesting? Um, why don't you? Sauce, Odson, and Zygmunt. Would you like me to say who I like in this game? It's pretty obvious. Well, I don't think you like the segment in this game. I think you like Sauce in this game, and oh, I'm not actually sure what your opinion of Odson is. So I, I think Odson's good. You what? I think Odson's good. I don't even think I don't think like I don't think uh, Zygmunt's bad or anything. But yeah, he's playing with two like absolute bosses. Yeah. Why did I pick this hand? I don't know. Is that blind? Oh, there's a hand down here. Oh, this hand's much more. Oh, oh, never mind. This is like okay, never mind. I was like, why did I pick this hand? Okay, so this is a weird fucking hand. So 100, 200. Uh, it's three-handed. Ellery, Sauce, and Otson. Uh, this hand's gonna be between Ellery and Otson. So they're about 146 big blinds effective. Uh, Thirty thousand dollars deep here. Ellery pots the button at 100, 200 with Ace, King, four, six with uh, Ace high suit, Ace four spades. Odson goes heads in three bets. Odson has four, makes four kinds. So Odson, man, what a sick guy. He three bets queen, queen, or sorry, queen, jack, jack, nine with uh, queen, jack, of diamonds. So he's got queen, jack, jack, nine. Hillary's got ace, king, four, six. And um, we see a flop here. The flops queen, jack, four with two hearts. So Odson flops uh, middle set with blocker top set. Hillary flops bottom pair with... Uh, a gut shot to a 10, and a backdoor spade draw. So Odson chooses the pot here, and Ellery calls. And the turn is a king of spades. So it's queen, jack, king, four, with two spades. So Ellery turns two pair with the blocker to ace-10, and a backdoor flush draw. And Odson still has middle set. Now he's got third set with... I guess, I mean, he has got a nine of spade blocker, which I don't know if it's that relevant, but he decides to pot, and <laughs> Hillary goes, uh, you know, whatever. What do you, Hillary, uh, Odson pots, the, Hillary goes all in, and Odson happens to calls. Now, what the hell is going on in the turn here? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, I think Odson's play, it's like, it makes some sense, like, Illyria's never obviously pulling a better hand, obviously. Um, but his hand is like very vulnerable, and Illyria might call with like two pair and a flush draw, or yeah, two pair and a flush draw. So it's easy to say that. Um, 
his hand like requires quite a bit of protection, and like if, if Otson checks and Nori bets, it's like a really brutal spot. I I'm not sure about Watson play. Uh, seems like he has like an okay hand to check. Um, it's brutal. Uh, it's brutal giving a free card to any kind of draw hero. So I can understand why he just he just reps it. Um, there are 146 big blinds deep, so on the flop he puts in... I mean, Illyrie's flop call seems bad. <laughs> on the um, flop, correct? I, I, I mean, I, I think I... I mean, I, tr I generally, like, have been trying to pull to way less sea bets. Um, I think it makes you extremely difficult to play against, and I think it's generally, like, right as, like, a theory play, um, because it's just too... If you just don't want to let people... Uh, like it's just it's just too too much of an advantage to be able to see that with a high frequency in so many of these spots. Um, so I will you know, basically want to prevent my opponents from being able to do that successfully. Um, this is too weak though. Um, I mean he has he has three outs to the nuts and uh, two outs to an extremely strong hand. And a lot of outs to really murky equity on the turn, and like, I mean, there's a, a lot of his like best turn cards. When Odson pops the flop, he's gonna pop the turn again. Like, selling like Odson, most of Odson's range that pops this flop is certainly gonna pot it again on a deuce of spades. <laughs> you know, like so even when Illyrie turns some like good equity, it's gonna be a shitty spot for him when he gets potted into. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's much debate over the flop being a, a good play or bad play. I'm pretty sure it's a pretty bad well, play. I mean, I don't know about that. I mean, I always want to, like... See the other side. You want to look from look from the other opponent's standpoint, well, like... It's okay. fucking complicated, and, and, you know, I certainly don't claim to be, like, a genius or anything, so when somebody who's won, like, millions of dollars a kilo does something, I want to, like, think about it, at least. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, but... You know, I think you should always have like an open attitude at every camp you see. Maybe somebody like thought about something you didn't. I don't know. I mean, the six of hearts is certainly not like enough to be like. If he had a hand that had the ace or king of hearts in it, like if he had a similar hand, like if the king of clubs were the king of hearts, I think it's a much better case for flatting because then, because heart turns, Watson's going to be checking a lot. So if 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 if, if he's getting a a check on most heart turns that he can go two barrels on. That's pretty good. You can go like half pot, half pot, and sh and get it in by the ripper as a bluff. That's like pretty sweet. And he has like a really profitable bluff. Assuming that Odson, assuming that Odson's never like assuming Odson's betting range is most hands that have like the ace of hearts in the turn. So like a, I mean nut flushes and nut flush blockers. Having the king of hearts is a really sweet blocker. Having the king of hearts is like possibly better than the ace of hearts on the turns because like if you expect him to never check an ace of hearts anyway, then having the king of hearts is better. Anyway. Because um, that's like the exact, that's like the top of his bluff catching range. So, I mean, in general, the, the biggest advantage of blockers is blocking the top of their bluff catching range. That's the most important blocker. Not necessarily blocking their nuts range when it, when it's a situation where like they can't have the nuts, you know. Um, the people can't see me right now, but I'm I'm, I'm smiling a lot. <laughs> I'm smiling a lot right now. <laughs> I can't have you talk about hands on again. They're gonna come to expect this strategy from this in-depth strategy from everyone on now. Um, you're, you're, yeah, I mean, I'm just going on a tangent. This isn't even what the hand is about, you know, like the hand. No, is you're, make, you're making some very good points. You're making some very strong points. That that the last thing you just said uh, when you're referencing bluff catching ranges is as a not an openly discussed thing, uh, even on training videos quite yet. So. I mean, even when you watch Phil's videos, he's not really getting I'm talking really shit about people making videos, and I'm just giving it all away. <laughs> you should pay me for this. I'll send you um, a stripper or something like that, I guess. I, I, we've already discussed that. I'm, I, I'm, I'm taken. Let's go to the next sand. This sand's cool. So it's between um, my friend, the Cleaner 11, and my friend, I mean, Al uh, Enemy. And a uh, long time, not very, not long time, sorry. Two plus tour, Yarny, Y A A A R N Y. Playing 2550, 100 big blinds effective. Yarny pots under the gun with uh, 6, 8, 9, 10 with one suit. Um, 
cock sucker cock I'm sorry cock maxi paxi uh, 2550 regular black calls <laughs> and the cleaner over calls in the big line with queen 764 with queen high suit the flop comes 367 with two hearts so cleaner flops top two pair with a blocker to the nuts and a queen high flush draw he decides to lead out for near pot and Yarny flat calls with 6, 8, 9, 10 on 6, 7, 3. So he has a wrap and middle pair. Mm. Turn is a king of diamonds. So it's 3, 6, 7, king. Mm -hmm. Cleaner goes ahead and pots with his top two pair, blocker and still queen high flush draw. Yarny chooses to call the turn. He no longer has top two pair, but yes, yeah, gone. Um, yeah, two top turn flop. And uh, I'm, I'm, begin I'm new at explaining hands. I'm getting better at it, though. Yarny calls a pot size bet. River four completes the straight three four six seven king Yarny only has a pair of sixes now and Cleaner has three pair so Cleaner decides to check Yarny decides to turn his hand into a bluff for half sorry a third of pot bet twenty two hundred inches sixty four hundred on the river and Cleaner snap calls and Cleaner wins a ten thousand dollar pot so what do you think about uh, Yarny's play to call the pot size bet on the turn which I think is Probably, I think it's close, and then to decide to bluff the river, which um, I don't think I like. But what do you think about the turn call, the pot size bet, and the river play by Yarny? Um, I mean, it's kind of close. It's like, I mean, raw equity wise, he can't be calling. I don't think the turn. But if he if he thinks that he can bluff hard rivers, it's quite a bit different. It depends on how he thinks. Cleaner is, is docking the swap for pot into three people or into two people and then docking again on the turn. How often he has a flush draw. Um, I mean, his ten of hearts is not. It's not like supremely relevant, but it is relevant. It's something. Um, certainly on a big heart river, his ten of heart blocker is like more important. He blocks more important cards. I'm like a deuce of hearts, but doesn't do that much. Um, I uh, think I just hold the turn if I'm Yarny, but I hate it. Um, cleaner's playing on the turn. They're on the floor. I don't know. Uh, cleaner docks a lot, so. What? Um, cleaner donks a lot. Can't play a lot with Cleaner. Um, he donks a lot, so I'm. I guess I'm down with him donking this hand on the flop. Um, yeah, I think if he's going to be donking a lot, then I think he needs some hands like this in his donking. He needs some flexibility on turns. He can't just, he, you know, if you're donking a ton, you can't be, like, super polarized. You can't just have, like, you know. Right, well, exactly. You can't be really polarized in support anyway. It's not like you can just have tons of pocket fives or whatever, like, but it's this, and peel up. Um... I'm 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 pretty okay with cleaner's play overall in the whole hand. I don't love calling the river with queen queen six of hearts in my hand. You want you want Yarny to be having more combos of hearts in his hand. Um, but on the other hand, he's calling. You know, he's getting four to one. He's getting four to one, and and if Yarny's calling uh, with all eight nine tens on the turn, then it seems okay. I mean, he's definitely going to lose a lot on the river. I don't mean he's losing a lot of money on the river. I mean he's going to lose. He's going to lose often on the river. Mm -hmm. um, but he's getting four to one. He needs to be right like twenty percent of the time, or slightly any better than that, I guess. Um, I'm I'm kind of okay with the way both of them play this hand. Uh, Yarny's bluff on the river, like I, I mean, I would just never check behind his hand on the river. I would always go for it. It's one of those bluffs that you make when you're just like, well, this isn't gonna work. But I sure as fuck am not checking back a pair of sixes <laughs> on this river. <laughs> like, yeah, I feel like this is a turn where I'm in Yarny's situation, and like, you know, someone like Cleaner bets pot to me. I'm just like, mother, like, like you know, fuck. I like, don't want to fold my hand. More than like anyone. Like Cleaner just checks for pots basically in like every situation. Um, Which is an interesting strategy on its own, for sure. Well, it has a lot of merit on a lot of boards, uh, this being one of them, for sure. Um, 
on obviously I mean he doesn't do that on like nine deuce deuce or something you know he's not he's good he's not retarded he doesn't he's he, I I don't like agree with some of the stuff he does uh, and I play with him a lot um, but he's I think I mean I respect his game for sure I think he's like good uh, you already too I think both of these are like good regulars um, and. I don't know. Yarny's play. It's weird because also Maxi's behind. Um, I'm really not sure about the turn. I'd have to. I'd have to think about it and do some. Yeah, I mean, well, Maxi is going to be all in for. I, I, actually, I, I probably should. Maxi did flat call the the. the you know, we should be on the. Or, sorry, the donk on the on the flop. Oh, Maxi only has. Oh, I didn't realize Maxi only has like. Yeah, Maxi is all oh, in. So he might he might think he's getting a better price. He might think there's going to be like an extra like sixteen hundred dead in there. I don't know. I, it's hard to just like decide on the turn right now. I'd have to like look yeah. at it and do something. Like that. More. Let's get into the last thing I have here. If it's, uh, thing is, though, like his his he's he's just like he's not he doesn't have really good imply laws in the river. Like you know, eight nine ten, uh, five eight nine ten. Those are all pretty damn like obvious outs for you. Mm -hmm. so, like. Claimer might just like check fold the set on the river when you get there. Well, you might say, well, why do you check all four? But you know, a four is not. I think a four is a bit different than a five. Yeah, definitely. Cleaner or Yarny has way more comes of eight nine and is under the gun opening range than eight five. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Fun hand. This hand. Yeah, I think Mask asked the question. He's a long time two plus three. He's always in the high stakes thread. He asked a question about this hand, but I actually think he. Later, said he misread the hand, but I think it's um, well, yeah, I think the river play here was was the interesting part. So this is at 100, 200. It's between Lot Nice, who is a long time high stakes no limit regular, but it seems like he's been playing more PLO short handed lately. Yeah, I've played a good amount of him lately. How, how's he been playing? What do you think about how his game's translating over? I think he's had a lot of good long term results at no limit. He's really good. I mean, basically, I don't want any really good no limit players playing PLO because they're just going to be good at it. Yeah. Opinion. I mean, he's like I, I like I said. I talked to Ike like a lot about poker PLO, and he he regards Lock Nice as like one of the best no limit players. So for him to be playing PLO, you know, it's not good. Um, I mean, it's good for him, not good for me. What, uh, what, is, uh, what does Ike think about WCG Ryder, uh, another person I do a podcast with? What does he think about WCG's game? I'm I'm pretty sure he thinks he's the best. Really? Um. He basically said that, as far as he could tell, I don't know if I should be sharing this or not, but I don't think it's a big deal. Um, you know, you... I, it doesn't seem like I'm not like sharing this. It's not like I'm talking about what he thinks about like some fish. Um, I'm pretty sure he said basically that, like, as far as he could tell, Doug was like just dominant in everything, like doing everything really well, and also seemed to like run really hot against him. So it just seemed like he was like the impossible one. Interesting. He see uh, he was high crazy. Well, I mean, I guess Doug's results kind of speak for themselves. It's the you match. know, with heads up no limit, with heads up no limit, it's just like I I've never been like good at heads up no limit. I used to play like some, but I was never like that good at it. But I've always felt like whoever was wearing the crown, the heads up no limit, you know, whoever was like the top dog, he's the top dog. Like that's it's. Come on, Mike McNair. It's the Cadillac of poker, you know. Like, if you're the best that has on the limit, you're the best. It's <laughs> oh wow, you can't beat like you know live super stud, fucking Badoogie, Badacy. I don't give a shit, man. Fucking heads on the limit. If you're the best that has on the limit, you know. We, we like we like you uh, when you had a couple of drinks in you, my friend. <laughs> what? I would I assure you I would have said the same thing if I was sober. Okay, I'm, I'm in. I, I hope so. I, I, but actually, uh, Doug also uh, echoed the same sentiments earlier about getting into live games. He said that, and we're probably going to do another episode very soon, hopefully. But he said the same things about live games, was that he was having a really hard time getting into any live games in Vegas, and he's trying to branch out to see if he can get any games in L.A. because he wanted to start playing those live high stakes games, too. So He's a pretty social guy, so it's kind of like, like, you know, he's happy to, like, play the game and chat and bullshit with people and, you know, chum it up or whatever, like, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if he got into some big games and they, like, the, the, the amateur the like him, you know? Yeah, I would think so as well, but, but yeah. he told me, like, he's been trying for a bit. And he's... 
there's also this thing where it's like, you know, like, if it, like the amateur doesn't want to play with like the tenth best no limit hold'em player in the world because whatever that guy's just some like grinder who's like awesome at poker, but you know he's with, like whatever. Why do I want to play with this guy? But like playing with like the best heads up no limit player in the world, that has its own kind of like sparkle to it, right? Where it's like. I don't want to play with any of these pros, but this, like, it's like kind of like how, like, they, they don't want to play with any of the best players, but they want to play with Phil Ivey, right? Well, it's kind of how Derry used to be as well. Yeah, it's kind of, like, it was like that aura of, like, this guy might be the best. Well, I don't want, like, anyone really good in my games, but the best in my game, that might be kind of interesting, just for, like, shits and giggles, whatever. Right? Not that Doug would be, like, the best at, like, full ring no limit or something, necessarily, but... Yeah. Doug is such a massive fish right now. He he's playing all the World Series events and he plays all these events he literally doesn't want to play the game in. Like he played 08 the other day. I'm sure he's not a fish in anything though. No, I swear to fucking god, the 08, 08 hands are posted on Poker News that I I, I I think I talked about I talked briefly about with him. He literally has no fucking idea what's happening. I don't think like he has an idea, but I just don't think he cares. Like he he made some of the worst plays I've ever seen in my life. Really? Okay. In 08. Oh, oh wait. You can't really make mistakes in that way, right? Like, you're 50-50 every time. I mean, uh, he, he tried. He tried his best to, to de disprove that theory, for sure. It's going to be an interesting summer for him, I'm sure. He really wants to win a bracelet. He what? Yeah, I, I, saw, I saw him in the, at, at the Rio. Uh, it, was like, it was on break of something silly. It wasn't even like the format I would expect him to play. It was like... It was like 1500 shootout or something. I was like, Doug, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, why are you fucking this shit? And he's just like, come on, man. Like, I fucking, uh, you know. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a good impression. Let's do that again, please. <laughs> hold on. I gotta, hold on. Again, come no. on. You distracted me. No, he's just like, I, he, he mentioned some, like, corny players that, uh, he was like, who are some people that want a bunch of bracelets? Come on. Uh, Dan, the, Phil Ivey. Huh? Phil Ivey. I guess, I don't know, he was just like, he was just like, come on, man, I just, they, they're like, oh, Phil Ivey wins these bracelets, and Vanessa Selbst, and whatever. I wanted to be like, Doug, Doug wins bracelets. <laughs> that's exactly how he is. Those who haven't seen WCG talk, that's how he talks, right? Like that. <laughs> I want the fucking glory, you know? Like they're like, he's good. Now he's got the money. He's got the online glory. Now he wants the, he wants the recognition outside of the online world, you know? It's kind of silly to be honest. He doesn't need to prove anything to anybody. I don't know if it's necessarily about proving. Actually, I'm sure. Well, no, it's for his own. It's it's his own like personal glory. It's not like he's. I'm sure he doesn't care like that. Like, you know, Joe Poker in the Rio parking lot goes up to him and is like, "Hey, man, I got a picture with you or whatever." You know, he doesn't care about that. He might. I don't know. I'm gonna. Oh, maybe, he does. maybe he does. I don't know. I don't know the guy that well. We're 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 just acquaintances. Well, I'm gonna ask him the next podcast we do because. It's pretty interesting. I think we talked about it last time too, but I can't quite remember what he said about it because I thought it was he was really he was really motivated to try to win a bracelet. So, sure. What do you think about Clink, Jason Mo? Very hated on two plus two. I mean, I like the guy in person. Certainly, we're like we're friendly. We say hello to each other. You know, we give we give the head nod. Hmm. Um. I don't know. I don't know anything to say. Uh, I don't know him that well. I kind of wish he talked some shit in, in person, though, to Vanessa, because he talks so much shit to her in real life, or in the online. You know, kind of. That's true. You're right. There was, um, so, for those that don't know, Vanessa Selbst and um, Jason Moe, Clink, 10, uh, a long time, 2 plus 2 are very hated, talks a lot of shit. Um, he's kind of like Star's Red problems in a way, but. Well, not an obvious. You know he's known and he and he. Yeah. It's it's a little different situation, but yeah. <laughs> he talks a lot of shit, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. So he, him, and Vanessa Selps were at a final table with uh, Jason's other friend Ryan Fees, and uh, Jason posted on Twitter that he thought Vanessa made some pretty LOL type of plays and she wasn't good at poker type of shit like that. And then they got the heads up, and Vanessa actually won, came back from a de deficit, and took the bracelet and. 
that's what uh, you're referring to when you say that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have much of an opinion on these types of things just because, like, I don't talk any shit and I can't really, like, bring... I, I just never, like, talk shit to people unless, you know, I mean, if they, like, if they bring it up, I might say something, but I never, like, I never bring up talking shit to somebody, so I don't know. I don't know the uh, the shit-talking etiquette, the proper shit-talking etiquette of what, how you're supposed to act, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who talks shit. Yeah, I don't know. I only talk shit about guys that are up a lot of money against me at online people are, like, like, well, you know what? I actually don't have the cleaners up that much money. I just fucking hate... I don't know why I even know I hate the cleaner. I think he just... I know why you hate him. <laughs> why? Because he makes it like 99.8% pot in every situation. Yes, there would be you time for me... It sense at the end. Well, I think that's a script. And that's why um, Arya Boo's multi-account, um, uh, Kobus83, I think... Uh, I'm not sure anymore, but I think he... He had some very similar tendencies, and Ari Abu did the same fucking thing. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you saying Kobus and Ar Abu or whatever are the same person? Wait, someone, someone that doesn't doesn't have a, heard about that? I, I, like I said, I'm not like part of the internet when I'm in Vegas. I don't look. I, I'm just playing live poker, man. There's no, there's no internet in Vegas. Listen, this is total speculation. Anybody that listens to my podcast know I love speculating about things, so I can't either. Ari Abu did not play really tomorrow. What do you think? You think they? All right, go on, go on. What did you just say? I don't think they play that similar. Okay, now they might not play similar. But when Kobus came around, I feel like... I remember when Kobus came around, I don't even know. But they share a lot of similar table choosing the way that they... I, I've, I've watched them after I found this out. I was like observing, trying to observe Kobus during sessions. And there's very... A uh, small number of players, He's I think. Malta, that. anyway, his account, right? What? Is in Cobus location, Malta? Correct. And I guess there might have been some tax implications as far as Ari's old account. Ari Abu's account is Ireland. Correct. I obviously, I don't know. I'm not quite sure, but... So I talked to a couple people on Skype, and they already heard this before. And I think before it might have mentioned it in a, in a thread that that was the case, and he sought that for a while. So apparently there's like... More than five or six people that have been thinking this for a, a good amount of time. Oh, I didn't know that. I was not aware that that, that those two were in my head. Yeah, I've, I've, heard, I've heard some people mumbling about Arabu being Arrington. I heard that too. Well, you know what the thing is with the Harrington allegations, and it's just so fucking annoying. It's just like I've never played against Harrington, against Harrington Ten or whatever. Or I have, but it was like four years ago, and I don't remember how I played, right? So like. I play against somebody. I I like put, you know I ask about my I ask about who my friends like. Has anyone played against you know blah 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 one two three on this side or whatever? And then somebody's like, Yo, I heard that's Harrington. And I'm like, Oh shit, that was Harrington, right? So then I play against them some more. I like I'm like making notes like, Oh, this is how Harrington plays. Then I play against somebody else. I'm like, Whoa, this dude played like blah 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 one two three, you know? Maybe it's Harrington also. And I'm like, does anyone play against, you know, blah, 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 one, two, four? Maybe that's Harrington also. And they're like, oh, shit, that's Harrington. It's like Harrington is like this, like, is like this enigma. But like, how do I even know if the first person I played was even Harrington, right? <laughs> it's just like everybody who's just like maybe somebody or maybe it's, just, it's all Harrington. I mean, I think I played against three or, three or four of the, of the Har Harrington accounts, like Gozo Burrow, Longer Pig. And um, there were a couple others back in back in the day. Yeah, we were playing a lot. Can't beat is Harrington also, right? Who? Can't beat. I don't think that was supposed to be Harrington. Well, he's a lot. not Harrington, clearly. I played a lot of two four and three six and five ten with can't beat before he started playing ten twenty twenty five fifty, and we always chatted a lot. And I thought he was um. I thought I remember in the Phil Galfon video he like accused can't beat of being Harrington. Is that why I wrote that up? I think we're right. I don't. I don't know. I don't know shit about this. I don't know who's who. I don't know either. There's like, when I talk to some people on Skype, they, they give me some. They tell me some things that I never heard. I don't. I've never heard before about some of these things. So I. I it's, it's interesting to me. Every time I ask somebody what a screen name is, the and it's like an unknown person, the answer is always one of two things. It's either Harrington, or it's Turrets. Always. Or two, oh, uh, Mikel Theret, Charan, Ch 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 1993. Charan, yeah, Charan. Well, Charan actually is third. Yeah, what well, other people couldn't. Yeah, I, don't, I, 
I don't follow much of the who are the screen names these days, so I don't know who's um, who's being questioned. How fucking hard is it to just play on your own screen name? How hard is it? Sometimes it's hard. You play on it. Sometimes oh, people don't play you. Tough shit. You don't get to just fucking pick a new screen name. Piece of shit. Well, sometimes people want some new want some new action, or they're too good. Well, they both people are scumbags, and 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 I hope they get hit by a car. Sorry, I don't actually hope they hit get hit by a car. Okay, we um 100 days. My bet says I want more se- Ansky semi drunk strategy. <laughs> he says I want more Ansky semi drunk strategy. I'm glad he gave me the credit of only being semi drunk. Very nice guy. Yeah. Where are we at now? Probably should wrap this up here. Actually, we're in pretty long. I try, man. I really like the live stream because we can just talk forever. As long as it's interesting, like you asked me, what are we gonna talk about? I'm like, ah, I'm, we'll we'll figure out something to talk about and. As you saw, it's really easy to figure out something to talk about on the podcast here. So yeah, we got to flow it. It's um oh yeah okay. Someone asked, who would you like to see on the podcast next? They're asking me. Yeah. Who I would like to see on the podcast? I want Big Real on the podcast. I want Big Real too. I want Big Real. I people who I don't know who they are. Like you know, I could say like Phil Galfon or whatever, but like you know, he and I are like kind of friends, so I like it. it I know him. I don't care what he has to say about stuff on the podcast. because like, I'm just asking myself. Um, you know, so I'd rather I'd rather you have somebody like somebody that I play with on like a regular basis, since it's the PLO cast or whatever, that I don't know who he is. So somebody like, you know, Barry Sweet or D D two or or uh, or like I don't know any of those Swedish guys like like uh, D, um, like Jedi Master or somebody like that. You know, I love that Jedi Master on. You could have a, I mean, like I said, like I, I've met, like I, I'm like somewhat friendly with like men tolerance, so somebody like him would be cool for like, I, you know, I know. Like, oh, okay. so I, I, I'm, I've been hesitant to have the uh, European guys on just because I don't know how they're, at, like if I, I, I'd have Scareboy on because. They have a tank top, really. Well, they all have tank tops. The kids in Europe and Sweden, they love wearing tank tops. They have tank tops. They probably have mesh tank tops, actually. They probably have a scarf on their fucking tank top, too, so I, you mean. Yeah. If you saw George Danzer, uh, ex uh, mid stakes PLO player, was terrible at PLO. He won a bracelet the other day. <laughs> yeah, he did. He won the Raz, didn't he? Yeah, he beat uh, Stinger, got fifth in that event, and um, future uh, guest of the podcast, Brandon Sheck Harris, got second. He almost won his second bracelet. But yeah, George Danzer was wearing like a scarf and his sport coat and his haircuts, very unique. And I just couldn't help but thinking when he used to play PLO, and he wasn't that good at PLO, so. I just, I don't know, something about him really tilting me. But he's German. Really nice guy. George is? Yeah, super nice guy. Oh. Oh, I don't like to hear that. I'm just going to... Yeah, you don't like anybody. I get it. No, I like a lot of people. I actually (laughs) like a lot of people. So, but on the podcast, I can't like everyone. I can't be like, yeah, please. You got to be a device to figure. It's more, it's, you know, it sells more tickets. Exactly. Like you don't want people to be like, all right, or this guy's just talking strategy. I can put my smart glasses on and be like kind of dorky, but at the same time, that you know, it's more interest. People like they want to hear about you fucking girls and you me doing some cocaine off this girl's ass. They don't want to hear about me like discussing ranges. Yeah, totally. Remember I told you my mom was watching this. Is she still watching? You think? She's probably not watching. I'm sure she's okay. Uh, well, I don't do those things, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Stern. Of course. You know, I'm. I play poker at home. I have a girlfriend. I'm very committed relationship. I like to drink water, cook chicken, go play basketball at the gym, and sometimes go to music festivals and rage. All right. Are you going to EDC, by the way? I'll probably do like one night or something, because it's Friday night. Is there's a Friday night that day is the is the 5K six max PLO. Let's not even talk about that. That's sad. I cried. That cried last year during that. I'm gonna cry again this year during that. I I, I like there is there are very like five. It's like for me like like. Uh, Events on the year, it's like main event, 5K, 6 max, PLO. Oh, right. A half an inch below that. And I want to win a 6 max. I want to win a PLO bracelet so much more than I want to win any stupid no limit garbage. Everybody knows how to play no limit. Who gives a shit? You know? Um, I want to play the 6 max PLO. Just don't play. Like, I don't even care if I like, I just want to play. I don't care how much it is. I just want to play what it is. If it was 10K, I, I'd want to play. Yeah, they should make it 10k. It would get it would get some numbers, I think. People like, honestly, like six max PLO. The difference, like six max PLO, is so much better than full ring PLO. A million, 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 million times better. 
Like, if you look at, like, low stakes and, like, mid stakes and stuff, people still play, like, full ring no limit. It still exists, right? I came up in that world, so I have a lot of friends that still That's, play that. Full ring PLO just, like, doesn't even exist. Nobody plays it. <laughs> it's all six packs. Yet, at all the casinos, it's, it's all... It's much better when you have to play with ranges that don't just always contain the nuts. When you play nine-hand PLO and somebody just has the nuts every hand, it's a stupid game. I agree. Uh, lucky Chewy cameo. Joey, can you get Johan on the cast? Actually, I probably could get Johan on the cast. I'll ask him. Johan, the PLO guy. Johan five nine three zero. Oh, you, you're friends. He's another one of those guys that I like. I play. I played like twenty thousand hands with him. I just never. I've never met him. I've never. I don't know. A uh, long time. He, he, came up, he came up in the. Uh, he started like fifty PLO deep on and posted on two plus two and small stakes thread. And small six forum. And he I, I, he's a respected opponent. I know. I hate playing against him. I think he's. I think he's good, and uh, I'm certainly not happy to play. Uh, ha- happy to have him in my game. An idea for the podcast, but I think I mentioned at the beginning. My next podcast I'm doing is Thursday, 12:30 p.m. Pacific time, with Shaniac. He, um, Shaniac's very well known for coming out with about a, uh, an article on a website where he talked about doing crack for a long time. And I'm very interested to talk more about that with him. And you know, do you know Shaniac at all? Yeah, I've known Shaniac for like eight years or something, and just around. I mean, we're not like close friends, but you know, we've just been like casual acquaintances for. Well, he seems a like a pretty, he's a pretty interesting guy. Very interesting guy. You'll have a lot to talk about. He always has something interesting to say about everything, basically. That's the kind of impression I got. Was you know, he's he's. He's a writer, so I'm guessing he's got a very creative mind. His mind has a lot to say, and he has his own podcast, so I think I think it's going to be an interesting time. So, do we have anything else to talk about here right now? I mean, we probably could keep going, but is there anything specific on your mind you want to talk about, or uh, want to wrap this up? You're the host, man. You got you got to tell me. <laughs> I mean, I can go on for 15 yeah, hours. You know, for me, and I'm I'm happy. I'm. I'm... But, you know, maybe we'll catch up with you uh, after the World Series, see how you go, and uh, when you get reacclimated back to the online poker world and uh, get a little recap on how, how things went with you at the World Series. Sure. And uh, I understand that I'm supposed to re- run really good now, right? Well... Yeah. Podcast? I, is that how we're... Well, let's see. Uh, Lafort's up, like, $4.5 million since his first podcast appearance. Uh, Stinger got fifth in a bracelet event and is probably going to win something. Uh... Jamie Kerstetter had five caches in the first couple events. Holy shit. They should be it. Um, uh, let's see. Caremont. Let's disregard Caremont's results. He doesn't count in this in this scenario. So yeah, you're supposed to run pretty you're supposed to do well. Yeah. Alright. We get a little podcast run good, my friend. Sounds good. Alright, Donnie, thanks for being on. I'll uh, this is gonna officially be up on uh, YouTube um, sometime tonight. I'll probably if I don't go to sleep, I'll, I'll tweet the link out tomorrow and then um, yeah, go ahead, uh, retweet or share it on Facebook, whatever you want to do, and uh, let's see see what kind of feedback we get on it. Thanks for being on though, man. Thanks a lot. Much appreciate it. You uh good luck out there at the World Series of Poker, my friend. Thanks a lot. We'll see you. Alright, Donnie. Take it easy, man.